Hello, and welcome to Christian Scholars Forum. My name is Dr. Ez, and I will be your host today. I'd like to especially welcome any first time viewers, <clears throat> excuse me. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our regular viewers on Facebook, YouTube, and right here in the Zoom room. Christian Scholars Forum is a learning environment in which in-depth study of the Bible and other religious themes are encouraged. This forum not only practices critical thinking, but also challenges questionable doctrinal beliefs and engages in rational dialogue designed to cause paradigm shifts for better positive Christian living. Today, our guest speaker will present on the topic, the investigative judgment with relevance to the Seventh-day Adventist doctrinal beliefs. This will be accomplished through an exegetical and theological approach, which simply means that a critical analysis will be pursued as we think about God and the source of our Christian beliefs. The scriptures that will be examined today are found in the book of Hebrews chapters eight through 10. This will be a very exciting study. Are you ready for the breakdown? At this time, we're gonna have prayer. Our opening prayer will be brought to us across the pond all the way in England from Mervyn Bryan. You're on mute. You're muted. Okay, I was having difficulty unmuting myself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll invite the Lord's presence. We praise you, our Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, in which our salvation rests. We thank you for the victory that Jesus won at the cross that enabled him to enter into the Holy of Holies and sit at your right hand, signifying his victory <coughs> at the time of his ascension. We thank you for the author of the inspired book of Hebrews in the New Testament and Bible, where we are reminded that Jesus' work on our behalf as high priest is greater than that of the Levitical priesthood, being both high priest and king following in the lineage of Melchizedek. We praise your holy name for providing a means through the ministry and death of Jesus, followed by his glorious resurrection we accept your offer of forgiveness through the spilt blood of Jesus. We thank you that Jesus has the power and ability to forgive us and save us for the fact that Jesus only needed to sacrifice himself once and forever, providing us with salvation and eternal life. We pray now that you will inspire and uplift your minister this evening as he shares with us these wonderful truths on which is centered the gospel that is the good news of Jesus. In Christ we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mervyn. Beautiful prayer. At this time, we want to greet and say hello to our regular panel members, of which you are now becoming very familiar with, I'm sure. Pastor Arthur Branner, let's begin there. He is a graduate of the Theological Seminary at Andrews University. He's currently a candidate for a PhD in Christian counseling, specializing in forgiveness therapy. He's a former captain in the US Army National Guard and is currently the president of Science of Salvation, Family Life Ministries, and also vice president of Christian Scholars Forum. Pastor Brian Reed. He is a graduate of the Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And he also holds a degree in psychology and a master's degree in management. He is the executive secretary for CSF and the founder, president and senior pastor of Eden Home Ministries. He is a family life counselor and specializes in addictions and anger management. Pastor Brian is also an international evangelist and seminar presenter. Welcome pastor. And now to John Rosier. John is a theologian and an extraordinary historian. 
He's a graduate of Newbold College in England and specializes in world history, religion, and also biblical history. He currently lives in Hensford, South Staffordshire, there in England, and is a retired college professor slash lecturer. He is a uh, speaker, preacher, and quite a prolific writer, and the founder of OpinionSDA.info, where Christian academic literature is welcomed, edited, and also published. Currently, John sits on the board of uh, CSF as our chief historian and researcher. At this time, I'm sure, as you have heard in our introductions, that we have quite a few therapists on our panel. And so we believe in the excellence of mind, body, and soul. While we want to expand your thinking, we are still very much aware of the effects that new information can have on our core beliefs. Conflicting paradigms of perceived truths can often cause what is known as cognitive dissonance. So I'm going to ask Pastor Brian at this time, one of our specialists in counseling, to explain exactly what that is. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dr. Ez. And good evening, everyone, again. Good to have you to uh, be at our Christian Scholars Forum presentation again. Um, just want to share the information that I've been sharing with you on each one of our presentations that we do, that sometimes people hold to a core belief and they hold on to it very strongly. Uh, and it could be some personal belief. It could be something ideological, theological, or doctrinal. And what happens sometimes they are presented with evidence that works against what they already believe, what they've already held in their minds. And it creates an extremely uncomfortable pe uh, feeling to the extent that sometimes uh, people get really, really upset about what is going on and begin to have questions. And what happens is that these beliefs sometimes have become a part of who they are, their identity. And there is this strong emotional connection to these beliefs. And so for some reason, as human beings, we tend to have the need to protect that which we hold dear. You know, if it's a child, if it's your child, you're going to protect your child. And some people treat their beliefs as a child, and so they have to protect it. And so sometimes the need to hold on to these can cause all kinds of uh, emotions, anxiety, frustration, being overwhelmed. And some people even get to the point of depression and, and giving up. And the reason for that is that the human mind cannot hold on to that disconnect, uh, that dissonance. And so all of us have to resolve that. And there are four main ways that we resolve this dissonance. We either reject the new evidence that is presented, we e immediately accept it because we can see the veracity in it, we can choose to review it, or we can choose to be become angry and attack the source of the new evidence. And you know, within the religious sphere, often if you are the source of the evidence, you're labeled, you're called a heretic, you're called apostate, you're, you're called a backslider, whatever it is, you, you, you become a target of many, many names and labels. And so again, as you listen to this presentation this evening, which is going to definitely create a lot of disconnect for some people, just be aware of those attitudes. As you come to this forum, be aware of your biases and your predispositions aware of what you have been fed and for somehow divest yourself and just ask the Holy Spirit to guide you will be able to get through it with a clearer understanding and so what will you do will you reject will you accept or will you choose to attack I just want to share with you that you must enjoy is in the right place. Your idea in a religion or a denomination, not, not to be in any particular organization, 
but as Paul says, and you, however, are but you are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So you spirit, if the spirit of God, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so the question for you, belong. do you belong to Christ? If you belong to anything other than Christ, then you're is misplaced but i challenge you to ensure that your identity is in christ on christian scholars forum we are not here to convince you or to convert you we're here to simply help you to find the truth and expand your mind may god bless you thank you so much pastor brian two weeks ago on march 6th we had a wonderful speaker. His name was Pastor Larry Christoffel. Now, Pastor Larry spent 27 years at the Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda, California, and he shared many insights with us regarding his life experiences and especially his friendship with two of Adventism's esteemed and controversial scholars, Dr. Desmond Ford and Dr. Raymond Cottrell. And now here to present a brief recap of that presentation is none other than my husband, Pastor Art Branner. Thank you, Pastor. He's not he Pastor Branner, I believe you might be muted. All right, thank you. Each and every one of you with us. Uh, we are thankful that you come to have and share this time with us in this forthcoming. On two weeks ago, as was mentioned, Pastor Larry Christoffel shared with us a message regarding Daniel and in particular, the message of 1844. He began with sharing his own personal testimony affected by his understanding of the investigative judgment. He proceeded to share later adult years and his ministry, how he was confronted with the issue again at this Glacier View Dr. Desmond Ford. And, and there he shared with his students the treatment of Dr. Ford during the Glacier View interview. And he changed somewhat in that he was, uh, he was uh, put in check, so to speak, for his particular views regarding that. He then went on to share with us the views of Dr. Desmond Ford and uh, uh, Dr. Cottrell, how they were similar in many cases, their theology and eschatology regarding Daniel, the book of Daniel. And then he also shared some of the areas that were not so, uh, so much the same. Then he went on to share with us his view of what could happen if the church were able to change its direction. And he advocated that there was a greater need to have a better understanding of the pre-advent judgment, one that embraces and encompasses the true message of the gospel of righteousness by faith. That indeed and truly, if the church were to embrace a fuller, more complete understanding of the gospel, a true understanding, of the message of righteousness by faith, the church would be a powerhouse in this world. Well, this evening, we're looking forward to the expositional uh, declaration by Dr. Baldwin with regards to Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. And as always, we want to encourage you to take note, be tuned in to hear what the Spirit might be saying. We look forward to what Dr. Baldwin is going to share, and may God bless you. 
Thank you, Pastor, for that recap. And for those of you who want to see the full presentation, please go to our YouTube channel, Science of Salvation, uh, Family Life Ministries, or go to uh, Scho uh, Christian Scholars Forum YouTube channel. Okay, and so now we would like to introduce our main speaker for the hour, introducing to you Dr. Clinton Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin is a graduate of the Theological Seminary at Andrews University with a PhD in religion with special emphasis in New Testament textual criticism. Currently, Dr. Baldwin is also the president of the Baldwin Biblical Manual Research Institute with online studies that emphasize in the textual history of the biblical text. Additionally, he is the president of Christian Scholars Forum and the founder and president of Dikayoma Ministries International. Dr. Baldwin is married to the very lovely Andrea Baldwin. Andrea has a PhD in curriculum and instruction with a cognate in business administration and also has an MBA with special emphasis in general management. Dr. Andrea Baldwin serves as a professor in the Department of Business and Computer Sciences at Washington University in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And together they have an adult son. We welcome you, Dr. Baldwin, both Dr. and Dr. Baldwin. At this time, Dr. Clinton Baldwin, we especially welcome you and we ask that you now take your place on this platform as we examine together Hebrews chapters eight through 10, an exegetical and theological study with relevance to the SDA doctrine on the investigative judgment. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. We stand with you in prayer. Thank you, Dr. S. Okay, am I being heard? Very well. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, pleasant afternoon to everyone. And uh, let me screen being shared at this time. Yes. Okay, great. Good afternoon yeah. to our God's people. And I take it that you all have been having a great afternoon thus far, and you are mentally and emotionally ready for another study into the word. We will be looking at Hebrews chapters 8 to 10, and uh, it is so much. I pray, God, that I'll be able to get through it in a little under an hour. So I'm looking at my time and I must time myself. May I invite you just to say a word of prayer with me as I begin. Let us pray, Father God in heaven, we want to thank you so very much for the opportunity we have for peace and comfort and the opportunity God to study and to learn and to grow. As we do so now, I pray that you will bless my communication, may it be clear, May your name be glorified. In Amen. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. An exegetical and theological approach to Hebrews 8 to 10, implications for SDA investigative judgment. There are a number of that I will presume that my audience understand, uh, particularly with the investigative judgment, I will not go into details to unpack what that is about, but for sure, as we go through, uh, some understanding will be gained throughout. Okay, are we ready? Yeah, yes, Here. Uh, go ahead and play your slide back. We go. Uh, okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Uh, okay. That's better now, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Great. 
before I get into unpacking Hebrews 8 to 10, it is important that you be aware that we all be aware of our methodology. The methodology that you employ will determine the outcome, the conclusions that you arrive at. Very, very important in studying scripture that we first make ourselves aware of the methodology. The methodology that I'm using is, a, is an exegetical and theological approach that first uncovers what the passages meant to their primary audience. The book of Hebrews was not written to Christians in the 21st century. It was written certainly in God's intent for us, but it was not written to us. It was first written to people back in the first century. And as such, it had a meaning to them. And we can only properly uncover the meaning to us after we have uncovered what it meant in its primary context. For example, the words they use when the author uses the word law, nomos, it cannot automatically be transferred into our modern understandings of law. Law in the New Testament, for the most part, translated the Hebrew Torah. And Torah meant instructions and teachings. It's a holistic term that was not divided into moral ceremonial distinctions. There are many Christians now, in studying the book of Hebrews and the part of the New Testament, they speak of the moral law, the ceremonial law. Yes, you may look at a law and from your analysis conclude that that law could be moral, could be ceremonial. However, that is your conclusions. The Bible writers never spoke from that platform, they had no such understandings of God's law as some being moral and some being ceremonial. Very, very important when they use the word sanctuary and the word atonement, it's very important that we understand it from their perspective. Another important principle that governs my method, that governs my, my analysis is that the New Testament writers reinterpreted the Old Testament in light of the Christ event. The operative word is reinterpret the Old Testament in light of the Christ event. Very, very important. The Christ event was the reality and that it has the definitive control over the understandings of the symbols. Another point is very important as well, is that there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Old Testament symbols and the New Testament reality. And as I proceed, that this will come forward. And then, having done the groundwork, I will make applications to the concept of the investigative judgment. A little background to the book of Hebrews. The author is unknown. Granted, there are some of us that grew up in a tradition which says that Paul is the author, but I honestly do not know of any biblical scholar or any serious student of the Bible presently that would uh, uh, stick to that position. The author is unknown, and that has been from way back. Origin, for example, the church father said, who on earth wrote it, we do not know. The book of Hebrews had a very difficult time getting into the canon because the author was unknown and there are so many things about it. The, it, it, it was written to a Jewish Christian audience, more than likely, uh, well, we've got to bear in mind that just about everything in biblical scholarship is debated these days, but generally speaking, it is believed that it was written to a Jewish Christian audience, and we'll work with that for this presentation. Where was this audience located? Probably in Jerusalem or Rome or Antioch. It's up for grabs. 
It was written sometimes between AD 60 and AD 100, and some scholars even place it later than that, but we'll work this afternoon with AD 60 to AD 100. And the purpose was to de demonstrate the superiority of Christ's heavenly priestly function. A few special features about the book, and there are many. Uh, the word better, kritonos, kritonos is used some 13 times in Hebrews. The word better is used in the New Testament around 19 times, and 13 of those 19 times are found in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Jesus is presented as superseding the best of the Old Testament events. The author, what he did was to highlight the best of the Old Testament events and personalities like Moses or Joshua or Melchizedek, etc., and then places Jesus alongside those personalities and events and demonstrate how Jesus supersedes them all and is better. Uh, he focuses on Jesus or Christ as a high priest. Uh, three times out of the nine times he refers to Christ as priest. Nine times as high priest. He refers to Christ three times as priest and nine times as high priest. So he's more concerned with Jesus being a high priest than he is about him being a priest. I will now proceed to Hebrews chapter eight. Are you with me so far? Give me a wave, somebody, if I'm communicating. Amen. Thank yes, you yes. so very much. Uh, gone, uh, the, the, we are in a new era in which we now communicate first to a computer screen, and hopefully <laughs> the people behind the screen, they are hearing you. Mm -hmm. yes, and those of us who from grew up, you know, talking to church or grew up before laptop computers came around, this is always an adjustment. Yeah. We keep on moving. Chapter 8. The theme of chapter 8, basically, we have, an, a, we have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of God and is uh, mediating a new or superior covenant. And this covenant has the ability to perfect the believer. Very interesting. He uses the word perfect quite a few times throughout his epistle. Okay. How did he develop this idea? He states it explicitly in Hebrews 8, verse 1, the theme of Hebrews 8 and the entire book. Hebrews 8, verse 1 reads, the main point, the kephaleon of what has been said is this. We have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The main point, Kephaleleon, the principal idea, the punch point of all that you've been saying, the main point is, we have a high priest, we have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand. So Jesus is presented as a high priest par excellence, and that is instructive. That is important to the understanding or the unraveling of the concept of the investigative judgment. Keep, he keeps the, the conversation going regarding Jesus as the high priest. And uh, like the earthly high priest who offered sacrifices, so likewise Jesus offered a sacrifice. However, he continues in verse four, if Jesus was on earth, he would not function as a priest as he would not be, leg as he would not be legally qualified to do so. Nevertheless, he does qualify, verse six, as he has obtained a much more excellent ministry, as he's the mediator of a better covenant enacted upon better promises. 
why would Jesus not qualify to be a high priest? He had dealt with that already in chapter 7. Because Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And priests came from the tribe of Levi. However, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need would there be for another priest to rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priest would exchange of necessity, necessity, there takes a place, there takes place a change of the law. Hmm? So Jesus qualified to be a priest because there was a change in the law. And he's a priest of the different order the order of Melchizedek. A change in the law. Very, very important, please. Let's remember that as we continue. The author is saying there is a change in the law. And we will see later on that as he speaks about the law, he's not speaking about the ceremonial law. He's speaking, yes, about the law pertaining to the priesthood and the sanctuary, etc., in particular, but he's speaking about the entire Torah, the entire legal system in general. And he's saying there has been a change in the law. And this guarantees that Jesus was a high priest. And much more, the guarantor of a better covenant. We continue, verse 5. The function of the earthly priests were only a copy and a shadow, eupodagmata, and skia of the heavenly things. The earthly priest, is saying, was the, the, the function was only a copy and a shadow. The evidence for that was that God commanded Moses, see that you make all things according to the two pawn showed you in the mountain. However, Jesus obtained a more excellent ministry since he's the mediator of a better covenant legislated upon better promises. The earthly sanctuary was a copy or a pattern of the heavenly. He used the word copy, upo dagmata, skia, shadow, tupon, type. And this has been a big point in the formation of the concept of the investigative judgment of the sanctuary doctrine. The earthly sanctuary was a copy or a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. As such, therefore, the earthly sanctuary, it is believed by some people, solidly reflects the heavenly operations, the heavenly sanctuary. But is that really the case? Is that what the author of Hebrews was saying? What was his, what did he mean by the word copy or pattern? The meaning of the word copy pattern as used in Hebrews must reflect from the context of the book of Hebrews itself. Very, very important. It, it doesn't matter what is the meaning of the word pattern or copy in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter. The reason for that is the New Testament writers always reinterpret, transform, reformulate, and modify Old Testament words and concepts and symbols. It's a very, very important hermeneutical principle. You cannot determine the meaning of an Old Testament word simply, uh, or let me say it this way. The New Testament writers 
always reinterpret, modify, reformulate, change sometimes the meanings, the forms, etc., of Old Testament words and concepts. They modify them and reuse them for their particular context. Therefore, you cannot just go back to the Old Testament and make a totality transfer of the Old Testament meanings of a word or concept into the New Testament. You've got to allow the New Testament writer to tell you the new meaning, the reformulated meaning, the adopted meaning that he is communicating through in of the Old Testament word and concept. I hope I am communicating, and this is so very important as we seek to understand the meaning of the word pattern or type. Amen. I will just continue and let the meaning of the, the, that concept unravel as we simply listen to the book. All you've got to do many times in understanding these words and concepts is to put away your perceived meaning and simply read the text. So let's just continue moving through Hebrews chapter 8 and allow the meaning of pattern, copy, etc. to emerge as we see the trend and the flow of the conversation of the author. Am I communicating? Amen. Amen. Verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there'd be no occasion to sought for a second. Jesus' ministry is better because the first covenant was faulty. In verse seven, the author is saying, <clears throat> the first covenant was faulty. For if the first covenant been faultless, there would be no need for a second. And how do we know that the first covenant was faulty? Let him tell you. It doesn't matter our logical thinking about it. We've got to keep silent and let the author tell us how he sees the first covenant as being faulty. And how did he see the first covenant as being faulty? He says so right in verse 7. Verse, rather than verse 8, verse 7, the first count is 40. How is it 40? Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming. First, he said the first covenant was faulty. How is it faulty? God found fault with the children of Israel. It doesn't matter our logic. That's what he's saying. Let's continue. Because as we keep reading, all of these pattern, cover be, cover being faulty, because the people were the people had fought, will unravel. How, however, God makes a new covenant in which the law is placed in the man of the believer. It's be written in their hearts. I will be their God and with my people. No need will they teach the neighbor. They shall all know the Lord. And I will be merciful to the iniquities and remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to disappear. The evidence that the old covenant was faulty was that was the imperfection of the people. And he repeats that idea in chapter 9, verse 9. The evidence that the new covenant is better is the perfection of the people. Very, very important. The evidence that the old covenant was faulty, and just read the book of Hebrews, that comes so clearly. The evidence that the old covenant was faulty was that the people had fought. 
it did not perfect the worshiper. The inadequacy of the old covenant, by the way, is a theme throughout the old, the New Testament. And when we say the old covenant now, we are speaking of the entire arrangement that God made with Israel at Sinai. The laws, all the laws God gave Israel at Sinai, 10 commandments and every single law is part and parcel of the old covenant. The law is the fleshing out of the covenant. This is the reason why throughout the Old Testament, the words law and covenant are used interchangeably. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's look at some examples of New Testament uh, collaboration of the old covenant being faulty. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through to 18, the old covenant Paul describes as the administration of death written on tables of stone. Romans 5 verse 20, it caused transgression to increase. Galatians chapter 3, 25, it was a pedagogos, a child guide to lead us to Christ. Galatians 4 verse 30, it was the bond woman that was thrown out. Ephesians 2, it was the dividing wall, the middle wall, the enmity that stood between us. In Colossians chapter 3, it was a chiaphragon, the handwritten document that was hostile to us. In Galatians chapter 3, 24, it was a pedagogos, a child guide, a child leader. Yes, the law is presented in the New Testament as being holy, just, and good. However, that said good law, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, sin took opportunity of the law and caused sinful deeds. In Hebrews 7, 9, therefore, 7, 19, therefore, the author said it was weak and useless and made nothing perfect. Thus, it had to be set aside. And he concludes again in Hebrews 8, verse 13, it is obsolete, growing old, and ready to disappear. Note, the New Testament is not saying that law in principle has been abolished. What the New Testament is saying is that a particular formation of law, that is the old covenant was abolished. And we, and this is very, very important, you know, because the 10 commandments throughout the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 28, Judah 5, 1 to 4, in he, and Hebrews 8, 13, 9, 4, is presented as being the hub of the old covenant. There are many times when people think about the old covenant and they present the law of sacrifices and, you know, the quotes and quotes ceremonial law as being the old covenant, but the Ten Commandments is not a part of it. That's wrong. The Old Testament is explicit over and over and over and over the New Testament as well, that the Ten Commandments is part of the Old Covenant and the New Testament is explicit that the Old Covenant, including the Ten Commandments, has been abolished, set aside. So, oh my goodness, how can you say that? You have the right then to kill, to lie, to steal. And I hear many well-thinking, you know, Sabbatarians and other groups, you know, purporting this logic. I'm going to invite you to stop purporting that logic because it is sensible logic. And those who will listen to this presentation afterwards and in the question and answer we clarify more. Yes, the New Testament is categorically clear that the old covenant including the Ten Commandments has been abolished, done away with. Does that mean that we have a right to kill and to steal and to lie? Absolutely not. What it means is that a particular 
particular formation, a particular packaging of uh, those commands has been abolished. I have to take some more time, and probably one of these days I, I, I can do a, you know, a, a complete presentation of the Ten Commandments. Because see, the, the Ten Commandments, brothers and sisters, is not presented in Scripture as the gold standard for law. I'll repeat: the Ten Commandments is not presented in Scripture as the gold standard for law. It is not. Uh, it is not God's perfect, moral, eternal, all-encompassing law. It is not. My God, I wish I had the time just to present on own that the Ten Commandment is part of the old covenant that has been abolished. Christians, hear me well. Christians who hold to the Ten Commandments as a standard of God's law do not take God's law seriously. Mercy. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Christians who hold to the Ten Commandments as being the gold standard for law does not take God's law seriously, is not listening to the New Testament, mm -hmm. is coming to the New Testament with their own logic and not taking God's law seriously. So, so when the author of Hebrews says the new covenant, and I will write the law on your heart, it was not talking about the letter of the Ten Commandments. Hmm? Yes, it is speaking about the principles of all God's laws. Amen. But not the letter of them. Because, see, for example, if the letter of the Ten Commandments is written on the heart, then slavery is okay and ought to continue because the Sabbath commandment for it, for example, the letter of the Sabbath commandment regulates slavery and allow you to keep slaves. It's very interesting, you know, that way back in the days of slavery, the slave masters in America synthesized a slave Bible and they took out all the references in the Old Testament and New Testament that upheld slavery, or rather, that put down slavery and that slavery appears to be wrong. And I, I went to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. a year or so ago. The slave Bible was on display. And so I quickly turned to Exodus chapter 20 to see if they would have taken out the Ten Commandments. And guess what? The Ten Commandments was left intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you obey the letter of the Sabbath commandment, you have the right to keep slaves. So when the Holy Spirit write the wow. law on your heart, it could not write the letter of the Ten Commandments. And more than that, when the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt not kill, it meant contextually, you ought not to kill your fellow Israelite under certain circumstances. It was not an exclusive claim within the context. And I could take them all one by one, going down from the first commandment and show Oh, as it was understood then, no Christian today keep the Ten Commandments as it was meant to be kept in its primary context. Mm -hmm. You cannot and you ought not praise God. That's the reason why I say here and the New Testament is teaching, when it speaks of the law in the New Covenant written on the heart, it was not speaking about the stipulation, the letter of the Ten Commandments is speaking about the law behind the law, the principles of the law. Jesus died so that the righteous principles of the law, Romans 8 verse 1, might be fulfilling us. Romans 7 verse 5, 6, we serve not under the letter, but under the spirit of the law. There is so much more, my God, that can be said. And by the way, if you go to dikayoma.com, D-I-K-A-I-O-M-A.com, my website, and click on the Bible studies, I have a number of half an hour presentations 
on the Ten Commandments on the Sabbath. There is so much misinformation that has grown up in tradition about Ten Commandments, Sabbath, Old Covenant, that is unbiblical and leading people astray, and they are propagated by well-meaningful Christian brothers and sisters. I invite you to take another look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a high priest, the author continues, who has taken to see the right hand of God is the made of a superior covenant that has the ability to perfect the people. Very important that we have a high priest <coughs> who's seated. Hmm. High priests never usually sit down when they are functioning, they stand up. Just look at some key points. Jesus is the high priest, not a priest. Is functioning on the throne of the majesty in the heavens and he sat down. Mm. You sit down after you are through doing what you're doing, huh? Yes, sir. Very, very yes. important. So he's finished a work mm -hmm. and so he sat down. Right away, we are getting an understanding of the concept of pattern. Because in the reality, whereas in the type, the shadow, the priest is always standing and walking around. Now this priest, when he takes up his duty in his sanctuary, he's seated. Mm. Hmm. Hallelujah. Jesus obtained a more excellent ministry and acted upon better promises, more excellent ministry. More excellent ministry cannot be a one-to-one -one correspondence to the Old Testament legal system. The first covenant and law was faulty. Evidence of the first covenant was faulty was the faultiness of the people. We are recapping. Jesus is the mediator of a kainos, a new covenant. Where there are two principal words in the New Testament for new. There are others, but two key words, kainos and neos. Kainos means new, different kind. Neos means new of the same kind. Mm. So if I have a mode of transportation, let's say I have a bicycle and it's, it has grown old and somehow someone presents me with a new mode of transportation, a car. I have a new mode of transportation, a kind of mode of transportation now. If I get a, another refurbished bicycle, then that is new, but of the same kind, the same order. If I get a car in place of the bicycle, both instruments can transport, but the car is a kind of mode of transportation. It's a new in a different kind, a different form. Jesus is a mediator of a new, a kind of covenant, new in a different form, new with different principles and outworkings and operations. Mm. And throughout the book, he shows that the priests, the earthly priest of the sinner. Jesus is sinless. Yes. Amen. Chapter 7 going onwards. The ministry of the earthly priest was imperfect in the time. Jesus' ministry is perfect. Yes. The earthly priest's ministry was terminated by death. Jesus continues forever. <clears throat> the earthly priest was forever making offerings. Jesus made one offering for all times for sin. Yes. His ministry is kindness. His covenant is kindness. His new there was no successive climax to the priest's work in the type. Jesus' work was completed, hence he sat down. The earthly priest and the type in the shadow belonged to the tribe of Levi. Jesus belonged to a different tribe, so to speak, a different order, the order of Melchizedek. The earthly priest entered symbolically in the presence of God. Jesus lives in the presence of God forever. In fact, he's God. Amen. That's new of a different kind, a different, or, a different order. The pattern is not one and the same as the reality. Mm. 
In the old covenant, the law was written on stone. In the new covenant, the law is written on the hearts of individuals. The old covenant had law of sacrifices. I'm sorry, the old covenant, the sacrifices were animals. In the new covenant, in the reality, the sacrifice is what? A person, a human being. Do you know who that human being is? Jesus. Amen. In the old covenant, the temple was a building. In the new covenant, the temple is a person. Yes, sir. Amen. Yet the New Testament is saying that uh, the earthly system is a pattern of the heavenly. But here we are seeing that the reality does not bear a one-to-one -one correspondence to the shadow, the, sim the symbol that points to it. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. So just by looking at the whole tenure of the book, we come to understand what he means by the heavenly sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary is a pattern of the heavenly. He was not saying that the earthly was a blueprint, was a Xerox copy, was a duplicate of the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. He wasn't saying that. Sometimes I wonder, when you think of the earth, the sanctuary, you know, there is a altar of burnt offering in the courtyard, and then there's altar of incense and lava and everything. Are you telling me that in heaven, there's an altar of burnt offering and a lava and all of these things to represent Jesus, who is the reality, who is right there in heaven and God? Come on, people. Mm. The veil in the old covenant was a cloth. Yeah, it's made of cloth. The veil in the new covenant, in the reality, is the body of Jesus. Hebrews 10, verse 20. We'll get to that. The mercy seat was a wooden box overlaid with gold in the old covenant. Jesus is the mercy seat. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Paul presents Jesus as our hilasterian, mm. translated expiation or propitiation. The word there is hilasterion, which means mercy seat. And not just that, but the Greek says he is a mercy seat, literally, with his blood upon it. Hallelujah. Man. Beautiful. You don't see it in the Greek, in the English, but it's right there in the Greek. Mm -hmm. He's a hilasterion with his blood upon it. Mm -hmm. He's a mercy seat. So the mercy seat is no longer a box, it's a person. So mm -hmm. Jesus is the priest, is a temple, is a sacrifice. And the old covenant couldn't actually cleanse from sin, but if Jesus effectually cleansed from sin, the old covenant, the, 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 the type was symbolic. Jesus is the reality. Therefore, copy and shadow cannot mean a duplicate representation of. There cannot be a one-to-one -one correspondence. You know, uh, let, let me just quote from Earl Ellis here. I read some quote from Earl Ellis. Here, Earl Ellis, as quoted in Desmond Ford. The Old Covenant, the, the Old Testament type was not only, not only corresponds to the New Age reality, but also stands in antithesis to it. Like Adam, Jesus is representative headman of the race. But unlike Adam, who brought death, Jesus brings forgiveness and life. Jesus is a prophet like Moses. But unlike Moses, his ministry of condemnation, that of Jesus gives righteousness. Similarly, the law is holy, just, and good, and his commandments are to be fulfilled in the believer. Yet as a demand upon man, it can only condemn him. One may speak then of synthetic and on an antisynthetic typology. I'll run it again. One may speak of synthetic and antisynthetic typology, similar to and different from. Mm. In other words, type teach by way of contrast as well as parallel. Consider the type chiefly used in Hebrews, second paragraph, that of the Day of Atonement. In the type, a man went into the most holy once a year, recurringly. 
In the antitype, the God man enters once for all time. In the type, the one who entered in was a sinner and mortal and needed to offer first for his own sins. In the type, the blood was not, your picture here is blocked, the, the blood. Uh, was not the priest's own. Oh, I am um, lost my slot. In the type, the blood was not the priest's own, but that of an animal. The slain creature did not revive on the third day. In the type, the most holy was almost empty. Hmm? Hebrews often changes the Old Testament picture in order to match the fulfillment at Calvary. Very, very important. Hebrews always changes the Old Testament picture in order to match the fulfillment of Calvary. Mm. I said that in my opening sentences that the New Testament writers normally transform, reformulate the Old Testament realities. They turn them around. Close study of Hebrews 9 shows that in verses 13 to 21, repeated deviation from the Old Testament placement in details by references to sprinkled blood of goats upon people in order to show the efficacy of Calvary. The true day of atonement, sprinkling that has atoned for this in the world. In the Old Testament record, the blood was not, quote unquote, sprinkled at the time of the ratification of the covenant. Neither was the blood of goats. In fact, the red heifer cleansing did not include of persons with blood of goats and bulls despite verse 13. Hebrews 8 verse 5 refers to Exodus 25 verse 40, which speaks of the pattern given to Moses. Was this a scale model of heavenly sanctuary? We must remember the temple of Solomon was also described by divine revelation, but it had 10 set of candlesticks. The tables of showbread, four cherubims, etc. Which is, which is a scale model, the temple, the tabernacle, or the temple? Very, very important. Solomon's temple was also given by divine command. Yet, the design, the layout, the furniture, and many other things in Solomon's temple was much different from that of the tablet in the, in, in the wilderness. And by the way, Exodus 25 said that God said to Moses, make it as a pattern showed you in the mount. He doesn't explicitly say the pattern was in heaven. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we look mm -hmm. at all the ancient sanctuaries, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, uh, the, the Akkadians, and all the, the Ugaritic, all the ancient sanctuaries, they all had the basic structure of a courtyard, a holy place, and a most holy place. That's one of the discussion. What are some of the implications for 1844? The function of Jesus in heaven is high priestly functions. Very, very important. Jesus functioned in heaven as high as a high priest. Irrespective of which is located, irrespective of where Jesus is located in heaven, he started doing high priestly functions from the time of his ascension. Therefore, the Day of Atonement could not have begun in 1844. It started from Calvary. Yes. As such, the special people remnant designation derived from the 1844 construct ought to have been derived and started from the cross. The special people remnant designation derived from the 1844 constructor ought to have been derived from and started from those who are in Jesus are remnant, not those who belong to a particular denomination. And I know that, you know, Revelation 12, Amen. verse 17 is butchered, and the dragon was wrath with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Therefore, mm, the special people are those who keep the commandments of God, and they are God's remnant. I'm going to ask kindly that those Adventist evangelists and pastors 
who are propagating this particular interpretation of Revelation 12, 17, etc., just kindly, you know, in fairness to the scriptures, in fairness to good biblical understanding and hermeneutics, listen even to some of your professors. Or, you know, take a time out to just read the passage from the Greek, from the original, etc., and stop saying that. I know, you know, I grew up saying it too, yeah. as well. For, for, for many, many years, I preached it for the most of my 50 years in Adventism. The dragon was wrath with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Ah, to keep the commandments of God. What are the commandments of God? Ten commandments. Uh, it's time we take those old time, you know, exegesis off the table. And, you know, I, I'm appealing. Mm -hmm. The woman there in Revelation 12 has to do with the entire Christian church not a segment of it. The word remnant is a mistranslation. John did not say remnant. He used the word loipoi, which means the remaining ones. Amen. Mm. The dragon was wrath with the remaining ones. In Revelation chapter 12, the woman has a male child, one seed, take them to God and to his throne, and those that were left were the remaining ones. They entire the Christian church at large. Yes. That's what the dragon was wrath with. And meant to make war with the remaining ones who keep the commandments of God. And when you read the Johannine literature, St. John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, the commandments of God is not the Ten Commandments. John makes a very clear distinction between the Greek word entole commandments and the Greek word nomos. And entole commandments has to do with that which emerges out of the life and teachings of Jesus as opposed to nomos, your law, the Torah. Mercy. So those who keep the commandments of God contextually has to do with those who are following Jesus, those who are in Christ, not those who are following ten commandments. Because the commandments of God that's enforceable in the New Testament is not so much a code, but a person in Jesus Christ. And that's for another study again. Mm? Amen. Help us, Lord. Beautiful. So those are some implications from Hebrews, 9, Hebrews chapter 8 for the 10, for the investigative judgment. I know it now forms the basis of remnant status. Hey, Jesus started his ministry as high priest before the book of Hebrews was written. Ah, oh, the standard for law in the judgment cannot be the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments form the hub of the Old Covenant. The standard for law is not the Ten Commandments. The standard for God's law is higher than that. Yes, it is God's new law, Jesus. And let's another study again because the New Testament presents Jesus as being God's new law, you know. Under the new covenant, we are judged relative to a person, not relative to a code. Yes. That's why Paul in Romans 14, 15, whatsoever not a faith in Christ, yes. contextually, is sin. Mm -hmm. mm? You say you sin because you believe in me. The Christian's law is not a code. It's a person. That's why God says at his baptism, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Yes. Jesus himself came and said, I am the fulfillment of the law. I am the new law. You have heard that it was said, but I am now saying to you, and when you read Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the I am sayings of Jesus, the antithesis are not one and the same as in commandments, old law, old Torah. It transcends it by faith. Far and sometimes it's a continuation and sometimes a discontinuation of it. Mm -hmm. The standard of judgment, the standard for judgment is Jesus. Let's move on to Hebrews chapter 9 because it, 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 it gets sweeter. Are, are you still with me? <laughs> oh, how am I doing with my time? Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Oh. Take your time. Take your are time. you still ready to go? We have chapter 9 and chapter 10 to go. It gets sweeter. I'm going to try my best to move through as fast as possible. You know, sometimes when you're driving, you know, you'll go around some corners and some 
and you have to slow down and then you get on some highways and then you speed up okay so sometimes you will, I, I, I will slow down and sometimes i will speed up huh? and when i'm speeding up don't mind you're, you're still gonna get it okay uh, they say i talk too fast sometimes but in order to get the stuff in with modern technology you can speed up sometimes because you know we can rewind and Amen. listen to it you know <laughs> so maybe i now need to get on to for those in the states i-95 and uh, for those in places like jamaica i am now on highway 2000 in which we can pick up speed up so we can reach our destination in good time <laughs> okay hold with me please hebrews chapter 9 that's where it gets sweet yep. and a little bit more complex and involved but beautiful and pretty and the gospel is shining through my brothers and sisters the gospel is beautiful it's uh, powerful mm. okay. and sad to say sometimes in our passion in our zeal we can obscure the gospel let's just forget about our preconceived notions and just listen to what hebrews has to say he begins chapter nine with the outline of the the, the the earthly the first and second apartment of the earthly sanctuary for there was a tabernacle hebrews 9 verse 2 there was a tabernacle skinny prepared the outer one in which were the lamps and the tables and the sacred bread this is called the holy place hagia we're going to come back to that word Yes. And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle skinny. Which is called Gion. Mm, and a whole big theology is built on this one. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies. Hagia Hagion. Having a golden altar of incense and uh, the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod that which budded and the tables of the covenant. Look at verse four. Behind uh, the, in the second apartment, the author is saying that it has the, the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant. Mm, listen carefully. The altar of incense was never in the most holy place. Mm. wasn't inside there and there are many other things remember i told you that the new testament writers will reformulate and transform and reuse the old testament information in different ways yeah. and there are quite a number of places in hebrews chapter 9 when you compare to the old testament it doesn't match up mm. So the author of Hebrews was not trying to make a tit for tat, one to one, total to transfer between Old Testament realities, Old Testament forms and New Testament realities. He was looking at the big picture and he was describing the holy place and the, the, the most holy place because he had a point mm -hmm. to make. Let's keep on above. Uh, let me go back again. Uh, look at verse 4 again. Having the golden altar of incense, the ark of the covenant covered all sides with gold, in which was a golden altar, all in the manner, Aaron's rod of body, and water. The tables of the covenant. Which covenant? What's the table there? The Ten Commandments is here being explicitly been described as being a part of the entire sanctuary system. The system that he will show has been abolished, is taken away. Hmm. And above it were the cherubim, the glory was shot in the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak in detail. Now, when these things have been prepared, the priests are continually entering the altar, performing the ritual service. Now, let's focus on uh, verse 7 as he continues. Apartments of the earth, the sanctuary, symbolic of the heavenly. But into the second only, the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into Tahagia has not yet been disclosed, while the second tent, the protoskini, is still standing. Help me analyze this carefully. But into the second only, the high priest enters. 
once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself from the sins of the people. The Holy Spirit is signifying by this that the way into time, whatsoever Tahagia is, it is corresponding to the second apartment. How do I know that? The rest of the clause in this sentence gives it away while the first tent is still standing. Mm. Mm. So the, into the second, the Holy Spirit is indicating that the way into somewhere called Tahagia is not yet open while the first tent or tabernacle is still standing. It is very clear. The way into Tahagia has not yet been opened while the first skinny, and remember now from verses one and two, he describes the earthly sanctuary as proto skinny and second skinny, first skinny, first and second tent. And he's saying now, the way into Tahagia is not yet been opened as long as the first tent is still goes without saying that Tahagia here refers to the second apartment of the sanctuary. He is only concerned with two, the two major apartments. But whatever, if you take Protoskini to mean holy place, as some people do, then so long as the first apartment ritual operates for that period, Christ enters into what was symbolized by the second apartment was not possible. If protoskine applies to the tabernacle as a whole, the meaning is so long as the earth is Sandra operates, the antitype of the ministry in the second apartment could not begin. In other words, the first apartment of the earth is Sandra symbolized limited access to God, and the second apartment represents unlimited access to God that Jesus has now gained. Note the word way. The first apartment stands for the entire Christian era before the cross, the second apartment after the cross. Therefore, the first apartment represents the entire earthly sanctuary. The first apartment represents limited access to God. Now that Christ has come, the first apartment ministry no longer exists. The first apartment into which the priest enters daily only had standing status while the reality symbolized by the type. In other words, the ministry that Jesus now embarks on is one foreshadowed by the second apartment, the ministry that Jesus now embarks upon. And when I say now, I'm speaking of the time of the rite of Hebrews, was represented by the second apartment. Therefore, Tahagia in Hebrews 8, verse 8, equals the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Let's keep on going. Jesus. In verse 12, he again repeats the point as to the place of Jesus's ministry. Note, the author of Hebrews is writing in the first century AD. He's writing about what happened before he started writing. He's looking backwards, mm. not forwards. Yes. Jesus entered through a skinny into Tahagia. Hebrews 9 verse 12, but when Christ appeared as high priest through his own blood, he entered through a more perfect tent once and for all into Tahagia. He entered through a skinny into Tahagia. He describes only two skinnies. One skinny is a holy place. Skinny number two is the most holy place. Therefore, if he enters into through wrath, if he enters through Eskine into another place, mm -hmm. that's right. It has to be the most holy place. Amen. Amen. It cannot Amen. be otherwise. Amen. It cannot be Beautiful. otherwise. And not only that, in verse 13, he backs it up by using day of atonement language as to the function of Jesus. For if the blood of bulls and goats, day of atonement, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who had been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. So in other words, he's saying that the function of the place where he ended, he, 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 he is doing day of atonement functions, so to speak. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Mm. So therefore, the summary use of Tahagia, by the way, Tahagia is a new to prove a singular meaning. I know there are people so he entered into the because tahagia is plural in form. Therefore, uh, he entered into the holy place and the most holy place. Uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of doctrines in that. Brother Arthur, you, you can help me, you know, in the question and answer. You can clarify this some more. But the point is, tahagia or hagia is a plural word in form with a singular meaning. And that is a common phenomenon throughout the New Testament. The word for Sabbath, most of the time, at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, the word there for Sabbath, Sabbaton, is a plural word, but the context is clearly, definitely speaking of a singular day. Ah, uh, the heaven, Uranus, mm, the plural in form, singular in meaning. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, the same phenomenon exists. Uh, the, the word for face, panima, the im ending is plural in, in form, but it's speaking of a singular face. Misraim, Egypt, im, plural in form, speaking of the place Egypt. It's a common phenomenon throughout scripture. And that's an issue. So that tahagia is plural in form, does not mean that it's speaking of holy places. The context will have to determine. Uh, and it's, it's a tahagia, uh, and, and, and my, I'm of the opinion that he's using the article in uh, the par excellence sense of the article, the Greek article, in, in, in which it is, as it were, is like saying, the holy place. Mm -hmm. uh? mm -hmm. Because in, in the Old Testament, the second apartment the most holy place was also called holy place. That's right. That's right. So, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, 3. Leviticus chapter uh, 16, verses 2, verses 3, verses 16, 17, 23, 37. The second apartment was called the holy place. Yes, sir. But context tells you that the author was definitely speaking of the second apartment. Yes. So when Hebrews use the, the, the word holy place or hagiah, so the word for the second apartment, this is not strange. And context is the determinant, not morphology, not word form. Amen. Context trumps everything. Yes, it does. So a summary of tahagia, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2, tahagion, refers to the heavenly sanctuary and whole. In 9, verse 1, the earth is sanctuary and whole. In 9, verse 2, the holy place of the earth of sanctuary. In 9, verse 3, Hagia Hagion, the most holy place. 9, verse 8, Tahagion, the most holy place. 9, verse 12 and 25, Tahagia, the most holy place. 9, verse 24, the most holy place. 9, 25, the most holy place. 9, 10, 19, the most holy place. 13, 11, the most holy place. Context at all times, most of the times, when he's in Tahagia or Hagion, etc., the new plural is speaking of the most holy place of the sanctuary. So the author of Hebrews is saying that before he started writing in the first century, Jesus had already entered the most holy place of the heavenly century. How under God's heavens we get that to happen in 1844. It cannot be distilled exegetically from the texts. And by the way, from the early 1980s, 1979, the Desford issue, most Seventh-day Adventist Bible scholars, particularly those with their, you know, in biblical studies, have concluded that indeed Jesus went into the most holy place. It's not a debated issue among Adventist scholars anymore. I'm very sad to say that Adventist lay people and some pastors are still saying that he went in the most holy place in 1844, simply because Ellen White said so. No, Ellen White cannot be the final arbiter because Ellen White, when you study her carefully, she also said that Jesus went into the most holy place at his ascension. And yes. she said, even in 1844, you can get yes. any God thing you want from Ellen White. Uh, so you do not study 
in light of Ellen White. You will study Ellen White in light of the Bible. Amen. Let's move on. Verse 12, Jesus entered, having obtained eternal salvation. And this is where it gets sweeter now. Obtained, he entered the heavenly sanctuary, having obtained eternal salvation. Verse 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered. I sell fain, Aries tense, the most holy place to Hagia once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Note carefully, he entered, completed action in the past time of the author of Hebrews. He uses the Greek Aries tense, which means completed action in past time. In the indicative mood, the Aries tense communicates completed action, finished action in past time and he entered having obtained yes. huramenos that is the greek perfect tense and the greek perfect tense particularly the greek perfect participle communicates completed action antecedent to the time of the main verb let's break that down oh, the Greek perfect tense, particularly the Greek perfect participle, communicates completed action in past time with ensuing results before the time of the main verb. Mm, let's go slowly. We have a Greek participle. The Greek participle takes its time of action from that of the main verb. If it is a, it's an aorist or it's a perfect participle, the time of action of that particular participle comes before that of the main verb. The main verb in the sentence in the clause here is entered. The participle huramenos is the perfect participle having obtained or obtained. So the obtaining was completed yes. before the entering happened. Yes, sir. That's <laughs> what the Greek is saying. Yes, sir. So the obtaining as is here was completed and because it is a perfect participle, it communicates completed action with ensuing results. Mm -hmm. mm. It's like the baby birth occurs, baby is born, ensuing result is a child. <laughs> so there's a completed action with ensuing result, which happen completely, finished, done, before entered, happened. Mm. The Greek is clear. So he secured eternal redemption mm -hmm. before he entered heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you. Or eternal. He was speaking about the cross, and the author of Hebrews was saying that redemption was secured 100% at Calvary before Jesus entered the heavenly place of the sanctuary. Redemption atonement was completed at the cross. Hallelujah. That's the Bible. Mm. And I know there are many arguments about it and around it and that sort of thing. The point is, we've got to keep silent and let the author speak his mind. He's saying, irrespective of our logic, that atonement, the redemption was completed. That is the force of the, his language and the meaning of his text. And this is not the only place he's saying something like this. We keep moving on because he's saying things like this throughout the book. Mm -hmm. So the blood offered without blemish cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The offering of the cleansing happening at the same time. Very, very important, you know. How under God heavens do we have the offering and the cleansing happening 1,800 years between? Hmm. John 1 verse 7, 1 John 1 verse 7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps 
on cleansing us from our sins. Mm. The us veer is John and his listeners and his readers. Yes. And he's saying that blood cleansing happens at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not 1,800 years between. Mm -hmm. For this reason, therefore, Jesus made it of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place from the redemption of the transgression that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal salvation, a new, a kinos covenant. And, a, uh, uh, and use the word here for covenant, the, the, the afike. And then he continues, and we come into a very important point. Now, bear with me. Uh, from verses 15 to 22 of Hebrews chapter 9, he speaks of the inauguration of the covenant, the importance of blood and death. Verse 19, you know, the blood of bulls and goats and the tabernacles, etc. you know, take away sin. According to the law, he climaxed in verse 22, almost everything is being cleansed by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Point, the cleansing of the sanctuary equals the forgiveness of sins. The cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, what we're saying, equals the forgiveness of sins. When you read from verse 15 to 22, he's setting up something which we are coming to know. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. This is a very, very, you know, to speak. Only if you fail to read the context. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these things, but the heavenly things, or the heavenly, worse things supply, with better sacrifices than these. I'll read the text again. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these things, but the heavenly with better sacrifices than these. This is one of the key texts used to support the traditional presentation of an investigative judgment starting in 1844. The author is saying it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heaven, that is the earth, the things, to be cleansed with these sacrifices, but the heavenly, whoops, there's a cleansing of the heavenly with better sacrifices than these. And we know that the priest uh, function in the holy place and then in, in the earth of sanctuary and then the priest in the most holy place etc. So therefore Jesus has moved from holy place to most holy place to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary as it happened on earth. Ah, my brothers, my sisters, the author of Hebrews is saying that the heavenly things ought to be cleansed with better sacrifices than these. How do you know what he means by the heavenly sanctuary being cleansed? How would you find that out? Simple principle. You keep on reading his arguments and let him tell you. Amen. You do not jump over to Leviticus. <laughs> because the author may not be used, or not, is used in Leviticus in a different way. The New Testament writers do that all the time. You know, even now coming to my mind, you know, when Paul, for example, uses the text in Ephesians uh, and, left cap uh, uh, and led captivity captives and gave gifts to men. Mm. My God. Paul was here quoting the, the psalm. And Paul said that Jesus led captivity captives and gave gifts to men. When you have time, look up that text in the Old Testament. The text said the opposite of what Paul said it was saying. Paul totally reworked the text. The Old Testament says he led captivity captives and received gifts from men. Paul said he left captive captives and 
gave gives to men the total opposite. The point, the principle is the New Testament writers will reformulate, reinterpret, change up the Old Testament to make their point because they were coming from a greater platform. They were coming from God's new revelation in Jesus and the new revelation in Jesus supersedes the old revelation and could not be contained by it. And so they reformulated it. There is so much I could put an entire day showing how the New Testament writers transformed the Old Testament totally. Therefore, when you see a concept, you cannot run immediately to Old Testament to get the meaning. You've got to stay with the author and let him tell you what he means by cleansing of heavenly sanctuary. Simply keep on reading the text. And I challenge everyone, if you just read the text, over and over and over and over with a clear mind, you will see that the author is saying the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary equals the cleansing of the believer, equals the forgiveness of sins, and it all happened at the cross. Amen. Let's read a little bit. Let's read a little bit. Therefore, hmm. the things on my screen are blocking my right. Okay, therefore. It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verse 23. He keeps on verse 24. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have indeed to offer to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ, having offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. When you look carefully, the cleansing of the heavenly equals put to cleanse the heavenly 923 equals the putting away of sin by the sacrifice of himself in 926 equals having offered once to bear the sin of many in 928. Amen. In other words, uh, wow, well, my screen is stopped just now. Okay. The heavenly things themselves put away your sins equals the sacrifice of sins. Bear with me. Okay, here we go. The heavenly things in verse 24. He says, he has appeared in the presence of God for us to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, having offered once to bear the sins of many. Please, when you have time, just read Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. It is clear, categorically clear, that the cleansing of the heavenly meant the forgiveness of sins which happened at the cross. The heavenly sanctuary was cleansed at the cross. Sins were put away at Calvary. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In chapter 2, Paul says he blotted out the chiaphragon, the handwriting of ordinance, and the chiaphragon there can also mean sins. And Colossians 2, 16, 17 says he blotted it out at Calvary. Yes. Amen. Have mercy. Amen. See, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3 says explicitly, mm. Hmm, when he started the book, he started the book by saying that, look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and he is a radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made cleansing for sin, they sat down at the right hand of the throne. You know, this verse again takes a little doing. Uh, when he made a cleansing for sins, uh, 
The word therefore made is a Greek word, poisamenos. It's a perfect participle. Again, you know, one of the standard textbooks for Greek, I'm looking across on my shelf now, is Daniel Wallace, Greek grammar beyond the basics. And Daniel Wallace, I mean, it's just about the most complex and detailed, you know, Greek grammar exegesis, I mean, Greek grammar book that you have in universities all over the world currently being used. Daniel Wallace, I think, is uh, Dallas, no, not, not Dallas, the Baptist scholar. And very good text. It's used at Andrews everywhere, huh? He says, when you see the perfect tense, take note, it's one of the most exegetically rich tenses in the Greek. When he had made a cleansing for sin, the word here for made is poesa. It's a Greek perfect middle passive participle. Mm. What did we say about the perfect participle? The oh, action is antecedent to that of the main verb. What is the main verb? Sat down. So the cleansing was a completed action before the sitting down occurred. Yes, sir. When he had made a cleansing for sin, he sat down. The cleansing for sin occurred at the cross. The Greek is crystal clear, cannot be denied. It did not start in 1844. Hebrew said it happened at Calvary. <laughs> not only that, you know, when we look at the word atonement, Romans chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son and the word, therefore reconciled, the Greek word katelage means atonement. And we came from a tradition that grew up on the King James Version. And the King James Version only uses the word atonement once. And so we miss the point that the New Testament writers in places like Romans 5 verse 8, Hebrews 1 verse 3, and many other places, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, when it uses the word uh, Catalage, because the King James first and translated as reconciliation, in other words, we miss the point that it was talking about atonement. So while we were enemies, we were atoned to God by the little son. God was in Christ reconciling the word there, Catalage, again, is atoning. And it's a completed action in the past time. And there are many, many others from the New Testament. And the New Testament presents them all as being a complete reality at Calvary. Cleansing, sanctification, reconciliation, justification. Let me speed up. For by one offering. Oh, man. Uh, wow, wow, wow. Uh, how am I doing with time? Good. <laughs> Can I take a few more minutes? Yes, please. I have a way yes, to go. Yes, yes. That which happens in heaven already occurred at the cross. That which is happening in heaven, the New Testament Hebrews are right is saying it already occurred at the cross. Look yeah. at verse 10, Hebrews chapter 14, verse 10. Let me break it down quick time. For by one sacrifice is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The word being sanctified, hagizomenus, is a present participle. By one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those who are in the process of being sanctified. However, in verse in Hebrews 10:10, 10, 10, and by that will we have been sanctified. And that's a perfect mm -hmm. participle, completed action in the past time. So Harvey, he was saying that we are being sanctified. However, these same people were completely sanctified already at the cross. Yes, have mercy Thank you, mm. Thank you. so that which Jesus is doing in heaven is not a different work from what he did at Calvary Amen. it is a fishing out of Calvary Calvary was the bank as it were heaven is the cashing of the check yes. that was deposited Amen. 
some key points. Hebrews 9. No two-phase ministry of Jesus in heaven. Hebrews does not have a two-phase ministry of Jesus in heaven. What Hebrew has is the holy place, most holy place, everything pointed to Calvary. Mm. And because he who went to Calvary is still alive, Jesus continues in heaven, as it were, as the full potency of the cross of Calvary. So we're as reconciliation, atonement, and all of those things were finished realities of the cross, because Jesus is the cross comes alive, then yeah. through his heavenly ministry, we have those being communicated to us through his Holy Spirit, huh? So Jesus in heaven is continuing the work of a finished reality. Yes. It's a perfect tense experience. He's implying to you. Which we do not have in the Greek, but the perfect tense coming to the point of an action started in the past, came to a point of culmination in the past, and the results are still in the present. So Jesus is communicating a finished reality. Mm -hmm. All finished, all done in him. Mm. And you know, part of the problem I think about this, you know, is that, for example, when we think of atonement and reconciliation, we first think of forgiveness of sins. We first think of what God is doing between us and himself, within us and Jesus. No, we must first think about what God did between himself and Jesus. Mercy. Jesus is a fulfillment of the covenant. He's a new Adam. He's a new humanity. He's a new Moses. He's a new every God thing. Ah! And so in him, God unilaterally forgave sins up front before we repent and do anything. Before we repent or ask for forgiveness, God took the unilateral action and forgave our sins in Jesus at the cross. Hallelujah. Our enemies, we were completely 100% reconciled to God by the Son. And now God is saying, you have been reconciled. You have been forgiven at the Calvary. Accept your forgiveness. Accept yes. your reconciliation. Accept yes. your at one moment. Glory to God. Mm. Prodigal son has already been forgiven. He came home wanting to confess. Father, before we get a chance of confess, Father said, my son, I forgive you a long time. Come home to forgive me, huh? Yeah. For illustrative purposes, the author of Hebrews was only interested in the first and second apartment of the sanctuary. The author's passion was to demonstrate that Jesus had already entered into the very presence of God. That is the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That was from the first century, not in 1844. It doesn't matter that Daniel 8.14 may be communicating that the cleansing of the sanctuary must come 2,300 years or as well. It does not matter. The point is you cannot veto the cross with Daniel 8.14. When Daniel 8.14 comes to Jesus, he reformulates it and changes it around. It doesn't matter the timeline that you can derive from that. Uh, very important. So there are some people who are using this wrong hermeneutic. Uh, when Daniel 8.14, whatever you take it to mean, when it came to Christ, to the New Testament, and to Jesus, he reformulates it, he transforms it. Just as how when the sanctuary came to Jesus, it was a building with two apartments, he made him body himself a sanctuary. When the animal, the sacrifice came to Jesus, he transformed it and reorganized it. So the animal, the sacrifice had four legs. He came to Jesus, he only had two legs and the human being, huh? And the sanctuary came to Jesus. It had an a, 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 a ark of the covenant called Moses. Most old place was a box. He transformed it. And now the box becomes our purse. And the priest, the human being, and the priest, the sanctuary, the animals, the every God thing were different entities. Now, all of these things turn one somebody. Come on. 
Can't you see there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Old Testament forms and New Testament realities? Can't you see that the New Testament writers weren't running a straight line from Old Testament and duplicating Old Testament realities and New Testament forms? Jesus came and he said that the new wine, you know, the old wineskins can't contain the new wine. Okay. Come on, people. Functionally, Jesus accomplished the ministry of the cross, continuing in heaven that was far greater than the earthly priest. The cleansing of the sanctuary happened at the cross, my brothers and sisters. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary was a past event when the book of Hebrews was written. Therefore, it could not have begun in 1844. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary meant the forgiveness of sins at the cross. You see, because in the first part of the book of Hebrews, again, you know, the author presents us as being God's house. Oh, it is so rich. Keep on going. Hebrews 9.23 is equivalent to John 1.29, 2 Corinthians 5.18, 1 Corinthians 15.3, Galatians 1 verse 4, Ephesians 1 verse 7. They all speak about sins being cleansed at the cross. There is no hint of a future entering into a phase that has not already entered. There is no hint in Hebrews chapter 9 of Jesus entering into a phase that's not already entered. There's no hint of he go, going into a most holy place and then return to the first apartment. Hmm. The only movement from the most holy place was Jesus' return to earth in chapter 9, 28. Both sides of Hebrews 9 is, from, is captured by Yom Kippur. I'm going to jump over to take a few more things in chapter 10. Bear with me. Give me 10 more minutes, please. Can we work with that? Mm -hmm. I think I'm going for too long. Let me go 10 more minutes in chapter 10 and just clinch a few points. Okay? Hebrews chapter 10, for the law, since it was only a shot of good things to come and not the very forms of things can never buy the same sacrifice year by year, which they offer continually make perfect those who draw near. Why the sacrifice of the law could not make perfect? Because of their repetitious nature, their continued conscience for sin, a reminder of sin is made year after year. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Again, day of atonement language. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as referenced in Psalm 46, God does not delight in offerings and sacrifices, but a body, a body has been prepared which resulted in the completed sanctification of the author and his readers. By means of this will, we have been sanctified yes. through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And, you know, as I thought about this text, so many things come to my mind again. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The word, therefore, sanctified, hegiasmenoi. Again, it is a perfect participle. Not only the perfect participle, but the periphrastic construction, which is a very forceful way, even a more forceful way, of saying the action is completed and the results are ongoing. The actions were completed in the past. Yes. 100% completed. Mm. The results are ongoing and we have been sanctified 100% at Calvary. Mm. Praise God. So completed sanctification of the cross with continued result. The cross not simply the offering of a sacrifice, but a sacrifice that effectuated something then and there. Come on now. There are people saying that Jesus Christ was the sacrifice and then he went to heaven to do the atonement. Uh-uh. The text says that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body. The offering effectuated something and that something the author is calling sanctification. Mm. In other words, as opposed to the offering of animals that could not sanctify take away sins, the body of Jesus Christ effectuated sanctification once and uh, for all. Down to the right hand again. The same thought is depleted plus the additional ideas offered that he sat down. Oh, oh my right Jesus. Hand of God. 
for mm -hmm. he reinforces the same idea using the word perfected for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified again by one offering is perfected and by the word the word is perfected wow. the same order the, the, the same ball park of word that jesus used on the cross in john 1930 it is finished there's the same order for by one offering. He has perfected for all time those who are in the process of sanctification. So we have ongoing perfection, sanctification and process. Okay, I'm going to skip over this section here in the interest of time and uh, jump over to, I want to skip over the most holy place here, jump over to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 20. Mm -hmm. Rather, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, rather, let us go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place, the Hagion, by the blood of Jesus. And here, again, the holy place, meaning the most holy place. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope which is sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. One which enters within the veil. The author of Hebrews is saying, Hebrews 6 verse 19, that Jesus entered within the veil. Ah. Yeah. This hope we have an anchor of the soul, a hope that enters within the veil. What is the within the veil speaking of? Most holy place of the sanctuary. And who? Oh, and there are some people who are very bright and they will say, no, no, Dr. Baldwin, the word there for veil is the word katapetismatos. And katapetismatos can mean the screen of the outer veil according to Numbers 3, verse 26, Exodus 27, verse 16. Of course, the word katapetismatos veil means in Numbers 3, 26, the screen to the outer veil. It can also mean the veil to the entrance of the sacred tent. Mm. And it can also mean the veil that separates the holy from the most holy. Mm -hmm. In other words, the word veil by itself can mean just about any veil in the sanctuary all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have some bright scholars who say, no, 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 no. When Hebrews says enters within the veil, capitis martyrs, you can't take it as offhand to mean within the second apartment, wrong. The point is, the author of Hebrews did not just say G, the, the veil. He says, Jesus entered esoteron to catapetis martos. He entered within the veil. Yes. And the term within the veil is translating the Hebrew Mabet la Fokelf. Mm. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to put it in English, but it's on your screen in the on the right. The little doogles here is, is a Hebrew. Mm. The first word is Mabet la Fokelf. within the veil yes, sir. when the term is used within the, the the septuagint the term within the veil speaks specifically to the inner veil mm -hmm. and there's much more distilling i could do but let me just in the interest of time says within the veil is again corresponding with the other place in Hebrews. Not only that, he speaks of us being entered, having been sprinkled, not in order to be sprinkled, but because we have been sprinkled. At the point, the salvation reality is accomplished at the cross. 
Just read with me these last few slides. Jesus entered not to be sprinkled, but because we have been sprinkled. He also showed that sprinkling has already occurred completely at Calvary. He entered not in order to wash, but because we have been washed. Mm, am I speaking... I'm, I'm reading it from Hebrews 10 verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near, having our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed with pure water. When you analyze the text, he's saying that let us draw near because we have been sprinkled, because we have been washed. Yes. That's what the Greek is saying. He, so we enter with Jesus, not in order to be washed, but because we've been washed. Enter not in order to be cleansed, but because we have been cleansed. Enter not in order to obtain eternal redemption, but because we have obtained eternal redemption. Enter not in order to be sanctified, but because we have been sanctified. 10.10. Enter not in order to be perfect, but because we have been perfect. 10.14. By the time of the lecture was written, sin had already been put away. Mm. A completed atonement made at the cross. Hallelujah. Beautiful. Hallelujah. There's no implication, my beloved. There's no veil in the heavenly sanctuary. Therefore, no compartmentalization. Because it's in Hebrews 10, the veil was rented at Calvary already. Yes, sir. <laughs> you ask the question, mm. if sins were deposited in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary for 1,800 years, how did he get in the most holy place? Mm. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8 to 10 affirm that a completed atonement of the cross, which gives a firm assurance of salvation and completely falsifies the traditional understanding of the 1844 doctrine. I'm sorry, but that doctrine is in the same ballpark of another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, which cannot be resuscitated. <laughs> it cannot be resuscitated. And Adventist are twisting themselves in all sorts of pretzels and, you know, all sorts of form, my God, trying to resuscitate. It is another gospel. The end result is a denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ on the cross mm -hmm. and it must stop because it hurts people and hurt them badly yeah. yes. may the Lord help us to this end so much more could be said but I know I've gone long and I do not want any Uticus to fall off any wall because you know I can't <laughs> physically lay because I'm on Zoom and virtual you know, I can't come and stretch out and raise them to death, you know. <laughs> so let's not have any duty because falling off the wall. I thank you so very much for listening to me. It has been long, but I hope, you know, the point was made and uh, we can clarify as we get to the question and answer. God bless you, real good. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Thank you so much. This has been a hallelujah time and I have been just shouting in my chair and praising the Lord and I can see in the feed everybody in the chat room we have been shouting praises and hallelujah and I I feel like running around right now but I gotta be still I am so filled with the spirit of the Lord and what he has done for me this is beautiful can we all say amen in this window? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Our amen. God has done it. And, and, and here's why he said, it is finished. Amen. What more can we add? It is done. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin. You hit on so many of the controversial points that my head is spinning because the answer was made clearer to me and I'm praying that our viewers and listeners who even on Facebook are chatting right now are understanding. I have sent this message to some of our major pastors in the Adventist church, and I pray they are also listening. And if not, that they will tune in and listen to this beautiful breakdown 
of the language of the Bible. Didn't you feel like you had another book you were studying, like 10 more other books? And just to think this is just the Bible. Rich, 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 rich. Yes. Thank you. God bless you. I'm going to open the floor to our panel members to share and discuss, give their pointers. You have a two minute window, panel members, to share and discuss each of you as we then will open up to our inner Zoom room for more discussion. So panel members, please go first. Ooh. Is this any of us or? Yes, or go on, go ahead, us, sir. Yes. Yeah, well, well, when I, when I first read through all this years ago, um, and I started to analyze it and even write about it, um, I couldn't see how anybody could come to any other conclusion. Quite honestly, I, I really couldn't. I, I, it was quite clear to me that uh, Jesus did not do what the priest, the mythical high priest did. It was quite clear to me that everything was cleared up at Calvary. It was quite clear to me that by one, he made one um, sacrifice for sin and it was done, finished, we dealt with. Mm. So what was the problem? <laughs> the problem is that, unfortunately, uh, our Adventist mm. forebearers didn't seem to grasp this. And because mm. they didn't read Hebrews, they went into Leviticus, we ended up with a problem. A serious problem that has been means that Leviticus is used to judge Hebrews, not the other way around. Mm. That's certainly what has happened. It's certainly yes. happened in some of the, some of the literature. Yeah. Thank you, John. Well Thank you, sir. Panel members. Hello, Dr. Baldwin. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, so blessed. Um, there isn't really much. It is so clear yes. yeah. <laughs> from a biblical yeah. perspective. You weren't just presenting your opinion, but but a, a very clear scholarly biblical with historical and um, linguistic evidence. Uh, thank you so much. If you could just for emphasis, yes, talk a little bit about the cleansing uh, in terms of what was cleansed in the Old Testament as opposed to what is cleansed in the new testament because you know we tend to put an emphasis on the the furniture or the building or the sanctuary being cleansed but what is it that is really cleansed thank you uh, in the old testament it speaks of the cleansing of the sanctuary of the building of the people in the old testament you have uh, objects being cleansed and people being cleansed and places being cleansed, etc. The author of Hebrews and the New Testament is saying that all of these cleansing of objects and people, etc., was just symbolic of the cleansing of human beings. Uh -huh. So, and the cleansing of human beings before it occurred in us as human beings, people, it first, as it were, occurred in Jesus. Must recognize it. Is that Jesus is a representative human being. And he, as it were, absorbed sin in himself, as it were, and expunged it. You know, I heard a preacher say that he put on a, a sin suit. Mm -hmm. he, became so sin. He, became he became sin for us. Yeah. He yeah. fulfilled the covenant. Yeah. So, as it were, so the cleansing of sin, or the cleansing of sanctuary and objects, all of those are uh, what do you call them? Figures of speech, mm -hmm. metaphors, etc., to communicate the point of the cleansing of human beings. And first of all, the Bible teaches that that cleansing before it occurs in us, it first occurred in Jesus, so to speak. Yes. Hmm? This is very important. And it's so beautiful. I mean, it's, yes. it's the assurance. Yes. So, you know, I think it's Roy Dedrin. 
late Roy Dedrin of Andrews, he has a very beautiful quote, which I, I quote all the time. He, he says that uh, the reconciliation, uh, the reconciliation that happens does not happen when the sinner, does not first happen when the sinner acknowledges his sin and repent of it and oh, come okay. to God. Okay. Reconciliation is something that happened already objectively in Christ. Yes, and when the sinner repents and comes to Christ, he's accepting the reconciliation. He's accepting that which has happened on his behalf already. Okay. So one man has already been reconciled to God. Yeah. One man has already rose from the dead, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the resurrection has started already. Yeah. One man has been glorified. So they've all been glorified already. You know, yeah. uh, and there's a verse in the first part of Hebrews in, in which Hebrews, you know, uses the, the same, you know, idea, etc. So yeah. uh, to answer your question, Cleansing has to do with forgiveness of sins and cleansing of sins, as it were, in people. Uh, the records of sin in reality, you know, the record of something is not the thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So if God, if Jesus is in heaven cleansing the records of sin, he's doing something symbolic, Kali, symbolic, metaphorically, as, you know, the, the priest in the Old Testament, his sacrifices means will not be better. So cleansing the record of something, you're really not cleansing the thing. Sin is a reality that exists within us. It's a yeah. power that reigns within us, Romans 7. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's only cleansed as the spirit of Jesus comes and conquers within you. I, I, I like the emphasis on the point where Jesus became sin and cleansing and purification had to take place in him first. Yes. What does that say about, have, when we understand this, about how we pray when it comes to asking for forgiveness? Does, does it change how we pray? No. Or, or it should changes, it? Yeah, it, it, it should. It, it should because it changes your entire approach to forgiveness, to asking God for things, to everything. Because when we come to ask for forgiveness, you know, what we are really doing, we, we should thank God for forgiveness, so to speak. Yes. That's yeah. We are yeah. cashing in on the forgiveness already given in Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's the reason why Jesus says, what, Mark 11, 24, whatsoever you pray for, believe that you have already received it. Yes. And it will be given to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not begging God to forgive me. No, man. Because I grew up where I was told whenever I sin, I pray to Jesus and Jesus goes to his father. He shows him his nail prints mm -hmm. and he's pleading his blood and saying, please forgive Brian. Mm -mm. No, that, that, that's no. how I was taught. Yes, oh. yes. yes, no, <clears throat> yes, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. No, God <laughs> forgave us up front in Jesus. You see, what happens is that uh, God gave his salvation to Israel, as it were, and uh, the faith means mark my word carefully, the faith means of acceptance. God's salvation was through the law. Right. I'm not okay. saying the law was a was a means of salvation in the Old Testament. I'm okay. saying oh. the law was a faith means, an expression of faith mm. in the Old Testament. Huh? So the faith means of accepting salvation was through the law. However, Israel never kept God's law perfectly they always so the old testament was violating god's thoughts so what it means is that they were not accepting the salvation through the faith means that god provided them that is law right god said huh this thing that's working so he sent a new israel yeah. and his name was jesus Amen. and he kept the law perfectly therefore he accepted the salvation perfectly on our behalf thank you lord Mercy. yes huh 
So mm. in Jesus is resident our salvation. He has accepted it from God for us. Therefore, all we have to do now is to connect to Jesus. Yes. And once we connect to Jesus, we have our salvation 100%. Although in terms of keeping the law, we are not yet perfect. That's the reason why the author of Hebrews says he has perfected for all times completely. Yes. Those yes. who are in the process of sanctification. Yes. <laughs> While you are keeping the law, you are counted has already kept the law 100% perfect. That's, That's right. the gospel. Yeah, the justification. That's because right. Jesus accepted it. That's the reason why I know judgment, the, the, the standard for judgment in the, the standard for the final judgment, or even now, is not the law. It's your relationship to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Because if the law becomes the standard in the judgment, nobody will pass it, can ever pass it. No, no you need it. Pass it. Not, but not, when yeah. Jesus becomes the standard, the issue now, mm -hmm. have you accepted him, yes or no? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you've accepted him, then there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 1, are those from Romans chapter 7 who were falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up. But Paul is saying, well, you're falling down and getting up because of the fact that you've connected with Jesus. Those who believe in him does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Because yeah. it's beautiful, it's simple. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. John 5. I want, to, I want to thank you so much. This presentation was so invigorating. It was so powerful. Uh, it, you just covered a lot of the areas that, you know, are often misunderstood and misrepresented. Um, I, I was just curious about something as you were speaking, and I don't know, I'm just, I'm asking uh, to get clarity from you. Uh, it, is it safe to say that in the Old Testament, it highlights um, the purifying of the flesh, the outer, the, the, the ritual, uh, ritual cleansing, Whereas in terms of the New Testament, uh, the, the author seems to um, focus more on what Christ has done and that he purges the heart and he counts us as sanctified because he gives us his nature. Okay. Uh, this is how I understand it. This is how I understand it. The Old Testament has, you could say both. Mm. For example, uh, circumcision of the flesh, the outward circumcision, mm -hmm. was mandatory in the Old Testament. However, circumcision of a heart, the inner circumcision, was also mandatory, mm -hmm. was also taught throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, the New Testament, however, places the emphasis on the circumcision of the heart and make the outward forms optional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what, what I'm trying to say is that in the Old Testament, you have the outward forms and the inner form, the outward forms being mandatory. In the New Testament, where the real thing has come now, the outward uh, symbolism, etc., is no longer mandatory or becomes optional, so to speak. I don't know if I'm communicating it clearly, but you know, as I keep on talking, I, I make it better. But the, the, the point is that uh, yes, the Old Testament has you know, the, the holiness of the outward, holy objects, object places, things, etc. The New Testament is saying that, you know, those things no longer obtain necessarily, you know, they've, they've been fulfilled in Christ, and what is now important is the reality. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Doc, there's another implication here. Yes. If, if you could contrast what the preacher is saying in the book of Hebrews um, with the the, uh, those, the the statements in Scripture that talk about the books in heaven. Mm -hmm. What what are those books of record? Be, be, because the the author here is saying that we have been cleansed. Yes. And having been cleansed, Jesus now goes to sit with his father. So what are these books of record? Uh, I don't want to believe if the author of Hebrews writing today may say the computers <laughs> in heaven, yes. so to speak. <laughs> yes, of course. You know, the, 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 and you can agree with this, John. Uh, to me, in, in the ancient world, the, the recording was done in books. And uh, it, to me, it's a metaphorical way of saying that God knows, God keeps records, yeah, God is aware, mm -hmm. you know, God knows. So yes, uh, our sins are before God. However, the gospel also teaches that the sinner who accepts God stands justified, is justified currently. Right. Mm -hmm. So the fact that your records are there uh, is not there, so to speak. Yeah. Because you have already been brought to the bar of God's judgment seat mm -hmm. and have been declared justified in jesus yes mm -hmm. uh, also, there is there is also something else here and that's that i notice that the books are never opened against the saints that's right that's right okay amen, they're, amen. Opened against, they're never opened against the saints because there's wow. no case there's no case against us yeah there's no case against us because we are in the sinless one yes, yes. so we're all declared sinless amen yes. Romans 8, who can bring any charge against God's against people? It is God who justifies. Amen. Yeah. Who can I know and I mean if you if if you see that situation, then obviously, because I remember looking at it in if you look at it in in, a, in um, Revelation 20, Revelation 20, he raises the dead. The only people that are having books open to find out who's in the Lamb's book of life are those who go to the second death. Mm -hmm. They're not the, they're not the no, not those who have been first resurrected further up the chapter. That's right. You've got a situation where, and that's why Daniel, for example, was told that he would rise in the resurrection. But yeah. if there's supposed to be an investigative judgment, how does God know that? Don't, <laughs> <laughs> is he a special case? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, fact of the, the fact of the matter is, and that's it, the whole thing falls yeah. to pieces when you realize yeah. how yeah. God actually sees us. Yeah. And, and, so, and, I, and I'll be that. And, but but Revelation three and verse five clearly says, "To him that is overcoming, the same shall be called in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name from the yes. book of life." That's, that's right. right, because that, that yeah. that's right. It's, it's there, and the and the overcoming is the fact that he resists what was going on at the time. He he, he remains faithful to Jesus against all the pressures brought around him. Yeah, I think it's that present. Uh, active uh, participle, if I'm not mistaken, right? It, it's the Re Re Revelation 3, verse 21. 3, verse 5. Uh, to him that is overcoming. Overcoming. It's in the. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I it's think it's 3, uh, I think it's 3 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame. He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Okay, that's a different one. Not blot out his name from the book of life. I think it's three verses. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, a, it's a very, it, it, you know, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's yes. a present active. Present part, part, the, the present part of the. Yeah. He who is overcoming. Yes. Nikon. Mm -hmm. I think it is. And yes. that's Revelation 3, 3 verse 
five. Okay. Believers mm -hmm. are already in the book of life. Yes. Of course. Right. Right. Once yeah. you accept. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 a done deal, and you know, just in, in support of what you've said, Doctor Baldwin, you know, it's not as if there needs to be any books in heaven to record. That's why the Bible says, "Lo, I come in a book." Jesus is the book. He yeah. knows everything. So he, yeah, he, yeah, he does. It's not as if, it's not as if he's, he needs a pen. He he is the book. He knows. He's, he's already he got knows. everything registered. He comes for his own. Amen. He, you know, mm -hmm. he comes for his own. That's that's the whole point. You know, he comes for the bride, Amen. and the bride mm -hmm. is a virgin. Remember. <laughs> this one is certainly a, she 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 has nothing tainted in her why because she's been inside that she she is in she's inside the new adam who is the bridegroom mm -hmm. yep. therefore effectively she's seen as perfect mm -hmm. you know these people who say that we've got to become sinless they don't understand what they're talking about we are already in christ sinless Amen. Amen. The, 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 the problem is and, and, and hear this well a, a, a key point is that current presenters of investigative judgment are saying that you have the hope to pass. Yeah. The gospel is saying you have already passed. Yeah, that's right. Amen. There's a difference between hoping to be fed and having eaten. Uh, the good news of the gospel is not that you will pass the judgment. The good news is that you have already passed. And the examination of Jesus and the believer's life, so to speak, uh, which can also be called judgment, is not in order for the believer to pass but so as to ensure that the believer remains in his past status. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. Huh? That is beautiful. So in Christ, we have already passed the judgment. Justification right. is mm -hmm. a verdict innocent, right. which belongs to the final day judgment brought backwards in the Christ event yeah. at the cross. That's right. Therefore, the Christian is already, already. declared, justified, oh, right. innocent, yes, yes. past judgment. Yes. And has eternal life. Yes. John 5, 24. John 5, yes. 24. He who believes in me does not yes. come into judgment, yes. but has passed yes. from death, death to life. To life. life. Beautiful. And he also says that in yeah, he also the, says the, that the, in verse 17 of chapter yeah, 3. Yes. The, so God the, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Mm, Whoever believes right. in him is not it's condemned. Not, but whoever not judged. doesn't believe in him stands condemned already. Judged already. And he goes on to point out at the end of that chapter that those who, those who yes, who, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, and God's wrath remains on him. Yes. We are born in wrath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, at one level, we are born in wrath. If you right. reject Jesus, then God's, God's, God's wrath it, remains it, on you. It, it stays on you. Yes, sir. If you accept Jesus, you pass from life to death. You're from death to life. Death to you life. actually change your status. According I'd, like to God. To inter I'd like to interject well, right here, uh, gentlemen. I'd like to you are born. You are born a child of God. Amen. I'd like and to. You're not by nature a child of God at all. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Doctor. Let, Go ahead. Let, let me get in here, Mr. John Rosier from across the <laughs> pond. <laughs> I love John. He is our. Don't, historian. don't get him started. Don't and get him started. Sometimes we forget this is not a scholars' meeting here. We got some people outside waiting to get in the windows. <laughs> oh yeah, let them all in. <laughs> just a moment just before we do since we are we have passed that judgment dr baldwin yes. that must give a new meaning to for, for some i should say to acts 319 that our sins have been blotted out indeed you mentioned yes. that in your presentation and and acts 319 is one of the favorites of adventism 
in which they say, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, which they have placed in the future as a future blotting out. So mm. in all that I'm hearing now, we can claim this blotting out immediately as we give our lives to Jesus. It is done. We have passed yes. that judgment. Hallelujah. Yeah, but, you know, it doesn't make sense to say that Peter yes. was saying to the people, repent and be converted. You're so off camera, that, though. You're off camera. Uh, you're not hearing me? We hear We're you. hearing you. You are going okay, off I'm camera. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense to say that Peter was saying to the people, repent and be converted yes. so that your sins will be blotted out 1,844 years later. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> That's too... Pastor Branner, you, you couldn't help yourself there. <laughs> That's too... It's got to. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it goes further than that, though, you know. It goes it, to the uh, Sunday law. It goes further than that. Oh, <laughs> repent, and yes. each of you, Acts 2, 9, 38, yes. each of you to be baptized in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of yes. the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 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 Even the very language there, the Greek and the language there is communicating <laughs> something that happened would have happened to the people as okay. Peter was speaking Amen. on the day of Amen. Pentecost. Amen. Come on, people. Amen. That text cannot be used. It's a proof text, you know? That's right. Yeah, and, it, it, and, and it's just it, after Pentecost. Yes. yes, yes and yes, if, yes. if this is a scripture that is used to, you know, exalt the Sunday law, you have just shared with us that the law was done away with. So what law are you going to, because the Sabbath, the fourth commandment is in that law. What law are you holding up representing for the Sunday law in, in that in that instance? You know, uh, Dr. Ez, I, 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 I hope I get a chance one of these days to present on the Sunday law, the Sabbath, the seal of God, you and those me, end time. Oh, you know, yeah, I, we, I look oh, forward to let's that. Let's work on that. Revelation. You know, that, I mean, I, I really, you know. Let's the, work on that. The, the, the Sunday law, oh my God. Yes. The Sabbath being the seal of God, the yes. Pope, the mark of the beast. Let's so, by, the way, by the way, the things Amen. that we're talking <laughs> here on Christian Scholars Forum, you know, let me say again, that some of the Adventist Bible scholars at Andrews at Loma Linda and La Seria and many other places, they believe these things, they know these things, they know that the traditional construct of Sunday law has been perpetuated by many evangelists and pastors cannot stand. And, you know, but again, it's not politically correct to say it. Mm? And I'm going to ask kindly, please. Mm. My fellow pastors mm, on YouTube, etc. And these are sincere men of God. I'm not judging their relationship per se. They are sincere Christians. And I spent a lot of time this week listening to many of them mm -hmm. on YouTube. I, I, I made sure to listen to hear where they were coming from, you know. And I, I just want to say to them that. Uh, many of you, you have been to seminary and you just push through the Greek class and the Hebrew class. I'm going to invite you to get back to it mm -hmm. and get back to your hermeneutics and do some more critical studying because what I'm hearing online is a rehashing of the old thing with some new nice flowery makeup. And please, 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 it's not exegetically correct. It mm. cannot be. It mm. cannot be. Listen to your teachers, pastors. Yes, yes. And know you have the power. Yes. And you have the bullet pulpit. And you feel sweet in your system. But I'm going to encourage you, please, read the Bible again from, you know, Please, please, I, I hear some methodologies yeah. out there by some good Christian gentlemen. Oh, my God, man. Dr. S, continue. continue. Yes, yes. I, Dr. Baldwin, I so appreciate each week when we are on that you make this appeal to the ministers of the gospel in the Seventh-day yes. Adventist Church. And yes. it's because we, we love this church. 
we were all reared in this church, but we yes. see where the doctrines have truly been an enemy to so many. And we are praying for clarity. We're praying for boldness of spirit. As we go into our audience, I just want to say this too. Um, even though we know and understand that we have been justified, we don't beg for forgiveness. That doesn't mean that we don't dialogue with God to confess our sins. I want to make that clear because many will run from here saying, oh, they are saying that we don't need to ask for forgiveness of sins because we're already forgiven. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that we, are, we agree with 1 John uh, 1 verse 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. He's not saying if we beg for forgiveness. Right. He's saying confess. That means have dialogue with me and thank me for the fact that I have made that provision for you. That yes, your yes. sins are forgiven. Come on and tell me what you've done wrong and know that it has been forgiven. But yeah, confess. Doctor. Confession is no. relationship. No, but yeah, doctor yeah. is. It's the different grace, from begging for forgiveness, grace, but we must confess. The grace yes. of God leads to repentance. Yes. Come when on. you recognize that your sins have been forgiven already, it is the greatest motivation to run you to oh. confess and talk about it. Exactly. Yes, exactly. God. Exactly. It has the How opposite you effect. Me, you know? uh, yeah. That's what, what the God. people were accusing Paul of saying, mm -hmm. that you know he was preaching you know, free for all and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And Paul was saying, no, 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 no. When you accept the gospel this way, it doesn't make you careless. Yes. yes. Come on. It makes make, exactly. Exactly. No, it has the opposite. I've, I've had some sermons that I preach and I get into yes. the of that. Yeah. When you accept what we are saying, mm. it makes you more passionate for yes. obedience uh, to keep God's law, That's to right. confess, to repent. And that is the methodology that God used, the methodology of grace, the grace of Jesus Christ leads to repentance. Repentance. Yeah. It leads us to, uh, not to do these things, people. Yes. Oh, and confession, confession and repentance are important, yes. but they are not synonymous to begging God to forgive. That's right. You know, and, and, and neither d does that mean that you don't confess. Just right. because God has forgiven, you confess. David yes. said, I acknowledge my sins. Yes. In, in Psalm 51, Psalm 38, in Proverbs chapter, what's that chapter? Proverbs chapter 28, 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but yes. who confesses them yes. finds yes. mercy. Yes. So we yes. still need to come and confess, say, I, I, I acknowledge what I have done. I'm sorry for what I've done. I want to turn around. Yes. Now, please, and thank you for your forgiveness. That's right. And his mercy extends even further to those sins you can't remember. Don't go fishing. It's Don't go fishing. It's not Don't go business. fishing. Exactly. You yes. go to Psalms 139. It says, search me, O God, and know, and know me. Try me and see if there be any wicked way. He's the one who fishes. And yes. surfaces that which you need to confess. Yeah. So what you don't remember, you are not held accountable for that. Okay. But we hear people pray that all the time. Yes. About yes. sins they don't know of. And the, 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 the point is, the point is, the point is your confession, your confession cannot be good enough to save you. Yet. Exactly. Yes. So your confession does not qualify you to no. be forgiven. Is because you've been qualified while you confess. So we don't turn around yes. and give glory to our confession. Right. Mm. Right. No, exactly. Your confession is a gift. It's a means yes. of accepting that which God has done for you. For you. Beautiful. Already. Oh, Already. Yes. Let's open the window. Let's open the window. All righty. Uh, let's go to our audience. And I did see a hand. Uh, Mervyn Bryan will have Mervyn first. And uh, we will continue to seek and look for those hands. Kismar, yes, wonderful. Okay, Mervyn. We'll wait for you to unmute, one second. Go ahead, okay. sir. Right, I remember when my uh, father, uh, John's uncle, first from his own studies, first started 
to recognize the fact that the investigative judgment couldn't be because Hebrews says what it says, as we've discovered this evening. And um, I, I started to hear my father explaining to my mom and myself what he was discovering. Um, now, on a personal basis, I found tonight to be the culmination of a lot of thoughts and so on that we've had with John, with John's mother when she was alive, with my mother when she was alive, with my father, and so on. It's all coming together as a parcel. So I thank you for that, because it's, it's um, it, really an understanding. For instance, um, we've mentioned prayer a few times tonight. I shouldn't feel the need if I believe what Hebrew says, I shouldn't feel the need to go to God and ask him to forgive my sins, but rather I should be going to God and thanking him for the forgiveness of my sins. And that to me makes, that is an absolutely astounding move. Um, transferring yourself from the place where you're asking, you're begging God to forgive you to accepting the fact that you are already forgiven. That's, and that's absolutely, that's what makes it good news. Amen. Amen. I think we have um, Kismar. Yes, hello. Yeah, hello. Hello, Kismar. Hello. Go ahead, Kismar. Unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. He might be having difficulty. He's on mute. Yes, yes. So I'm unmute now. You hearing me now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. Yes. So it's just a question I wanted to ask. Recently, I've been looking into the um the investigative judgment in light of the book of Hebrews. I remember, I'm sure I was, I, I, I remember reading once before, I think it was one of Dolly Mullin Conrad's book on the investigative judgment on Hebrews. And it seems like he was um, viewing the sanctuary, spoken of in it, the heavenly sanctuary, as not something literal. And I'm very certain I have seen such arguments before that it's not a literal sanctuary. I've never personally like look into it for myself biblically, right? But I would just want to know what I, I was listening carefully what was being said, you know. And I don't hear um anyone say that it's not a literal sanctuary, so I'm not sure. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Very good. What I want to know is if the sanctuary is spoken of in the book of Hebrews, if it's a literal heavenly sanctuary. So Christ is in a literal heavenly sanctuary with, with God, priestly garments on and these type of things. All right. All Very right. Good question. Dr. Baldwin, you have two minutes to answer that. Wow. <laughs> uh, put it this way. Put it this way. Uh, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the writers and the people in the New Testament times, right? These people, for the most part, came from a Jewish background. Uh, the Jewish people or the people in Bible times were concrete people. Mm -hmm. So they would not think in terms of a heavenly sanctuary in a philosophical terms as we today would think about it. So where the Jew were concerned the realities that happen on earth had some reflection in heaven, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would think of a literal heavenly sanctuary, yes. And the author of Hebrews kept on talking about a literal sanctuary in heaven, yes. However, his emphasis is not on the furniture and the compartments. For example, when he speaks about the sanctuary, he, uh, the veil, he says the veil is the body of Jesus. In other words, he's using the literal sanctuary 
to communicate a deeper point, a point beyond furniture and buildings and walls. Apart. And is using that just as a metaphor to communicate the concrete reality of Calvary. So when you read Hebrews carefully, it never goes into detail until the Christ is walking from here to here, or is carrying a basin, is carrying a pan, and he's doing this and uh uh. When he comes to what he's actually doing, he bounces right back to the cross. And Jesus. And Jesus. Yeah. And it happened there already. So in terms of their language, they use the literal language, yes. But we ought not to miss the point of the illustration, you know. We don't take the illustration. He could diggle the cat and the fiddle, the cow jump over the moon. The liquor dog love to see such fun and the dish run away with the spoon. If we get caught up in saying, huh, can cow jump over moon? Can dish run away with spoon? Ah, that's a literal thing, you know. Cow is a literal thing. Dish is a literal thing. Moon is a literal thing. Hey, but the writer of that nursery rhyme wanted to teach that words rhyme. Mm. Huh? So the point is, let's not get caught up with the literal language. Let's get the point. The, the message being communicated. The message being communicated. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the message being communicated is Jesus cleansed us from our sins. He has died for us. He has secured something completely at the cross of Calvary. That is the message being communicated. Let's not get bogged down with whether or not can jump over moon. All right. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Good answer there. Any any panel members want to give a 30 second blurb? No? Okay. I'm jumping over to uh, Don T. Dr. Uh, uh, excuse me, Larry Christoffel had his hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, wonderful. Well, Larry's here. Pastor, yeah. we're happy to have you with us. We're happy to have you with us, and we will oblige you this opportunity to share. Yes, you can and unmute yourself, Larry. Unmute, yes. He, he, he is a senior uh, statesman when it comes to this subject, you know, so yes, uh, yes. you listen Thank carefully. You. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to give you five minutes, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Larry, <laughs> not two. Yes, <laughs> he gets Go ahead, five. Pastor. <laughs> Good to have you. Thank you. Can you hear me to unmute? Yes, yes. We can hear you. You can hear me now? And we can yes. see you. Yes. Okay. Oh, there you are. All right. Des Ford applies Daniel 8, 14 and 9, 24 inaugurally to the events of Christ's first coming, consummatively to the events of his second coming, always in the sense of a day of atonement. Would you also see an application in the book of Revelation with a focus on day of atonement events related to Christ's second coming? Mm. Mm. Um, uh, 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 I, I need to revise my notes on uh, Revelation, on uh, you know all the details there. You know, so I, I want to be very careful well, how I answer but, that one. Yeah, go ahead. For, for example, in um, Revelation eleven nineteen. It speaks mm -hmm. about a focus on the most holy place. Right. And of course, it brings in the imagery from Daniel of the three and a half times, all from Daniel 7 through 12. Mm -hmm. But yes. it seems to be Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not focusing on so much the events of the first coming, although it's not mm -hmm. neglectful, just as Hebrews 9 isn't neglectful of the second coming. But is there an aspect of the Day of Atonement that the book of Revelation picks up on. That's what I was wondering. And is that something we need to unpack as well? That's a great Revelation 11, 19. Revelation. The temple of God, the temple of God, which is in heaven was open and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in the temple and there was flashing and lightning and sounds and peas of thunder and earthquake and a great hailstorm hillstone and a great right. sign appeared in heaven uh revelation that's just one text that's just one yes. of many that evokes as day of atonement 
Yeah, but I think in, in Revelation 11 here, call it from Ra, uh, what the, the, the opening of the, the, the temple in heaven here, but was speaking about God's vindication of his people, God's protection mm -hmm. of his people. I don't think John was trying to say that the Ark of the Covenant and all the contents were applicable for the Christian believers. I think John was here using, and I think Stephanovich in, in, in his Revelation textbook, I'll go back my notes on that, we show that in Revelation chapter 11 there, the opening of the temple in heaven was just a way of saying that God is in the process of defending, of vindicating his people from the dangers that are coming in chapter 12 going yeah. forward, etc. So I do not see, so it's, it's, it's there for atonement language, if you may use it, yes, but it's there for atonement language John is using to communicate a point of God's defending, protecting his people. And, and, and what I see is a, 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 in Revelation, there is a combination. The language is also Sinaitic. Mm -hmm. The Sinai experience and also the giving of the law and the Ten Commandments being placed in the Ark of the Covenant. So I am seeing more that the, the mm -hmm. deliverance language yes. in terms of God taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. And remember when they were at the mount, when God gave them this covenant, that there was this lightning and rumbling and, and thunder and earthquake that they feared. And, and the language is very similar to Sinaitic language. Yeah. Well, don't forget that the... Um... The Jubilee was tied to Day of Atonement also. Yeah. The day of, and and yeah. Isaiah 61 and Jesus in Luke 4. Uh, the Jubilee of the end of the Babylonian captivity, yeah. as well as the end of the Christian captivity. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not thinking that Hebrews and Revelation are at odds in any way. And I agree with Clinton with your beautiful presentation. Wondering the complete picture though on the day of atonement don't you have to include the emphasis that revelation gives as it unlocks daniel for example mm, oh you know I would, say, I would say uh i understand exactly what you're saying um pastor christoffel because if we look at uh hebrews primarily pointing toward inaugurated eschatology Mm -hmm. there would have to be at some point when the judgment would cease, which would point toward, you know, consummated eschatology. And so we see, I, I believe we do see stirrings of the last bit or portion of what, what culminates the events of what happens there as God is there upholding, uh, upholding what he has done in Calvary. I think we see a reflection of that, uh, the, the last culminating events and the Hebrew, of course, speaking of that in terms of Kate's, but then uh, the word that's used to talk about the very end of the end is akarith, and akarith is often associated with the culminating events of the judgment process. And so we see there the outline in Daniel 12 of those last culminating events, which I would say is consummated eschatology and where Christ finishes the salvation process where we are completely at one with him when this mortal shall put on immortality. Well, Ford um, would, would have defined the atonement with the incarnation when the high priest and he would have ended it with when Satan, the scapegoat, was the great enemy of God's people and the witnesses is, is killed. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, um, it brings in the whole great controversy theme, which also has to be part of the picture. Beautiful in terms of our salvation, mm -hmm. but there are other aspects of the Day of Atonement, I think, brings those out. Anyway, just the thought of maybe a future 
development. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. And, uh, one other question that we would have to ask in light of Revelation 21, if there's, a, mm -hmm. if there's an actual temple in heaven, if it's a literal yeah. thing, yeah. then when does, when does it disappear? Because in 21, he said, I did not see a temple. And so we would have to, that, that's a question that would, we would still have to answer. When does it disappear? Because sure. John didn't see one. Well, there's much more to say, but I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> thank, you. Oh. thank you very much for the oh. great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Larry. Good to see you. Um, do we have any other uh, I questions see, from I our... don't see any other hand, but there was a question. If... If the Ten Commandments are, how did they put it? If it's done away with, how would we know, how will we know what sin is? How will we know what sin is if the Ten Commandments are done away with? What a good question. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I think that question is using uh, the definition of sin first yeah. john sin is the transgression of the law yeah mm -hmm. uh just bear in mind just bear in mind that that is just one definition of sin in uh, the bible that's right. and uh, that strictly speaking mm -hmm. that is talking about sin being lawlessness as it were uh, sin is also defined as for example romans i think 14 15 What's the not of faith? It's not of faith. Is sin. Uh, okay. And, and he yes. was supposed to do good and, and do it not is sin. sin. Yes. yes. Keep the, 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 the point is that this is how the, the, the New Testament presents it. And I'm getting the details, much details in my presentation. But the New Testament presents the old covenant as being abolished, coming to a fulfillment, a close in Christ. The New Testament also presents Jesus as being the new law, so to speak. And when you are in Christ, then Christ teaches you Yes, what is yes. right, what is wrong, etc. In other words, you do not need the Ten Commandments to tell you that thou shalt not kill is wrong, thou shalt not steal, etc. etc. The point is the relationship with Christ. Christ, as it were, defines sin in a clearer, brighter, deeper way manner. In my yeah. book, I have an entire chapter on all of this. You know, all the, not coming back to my mind now, but the, the point is that uh, law, we're not saying law is abolished. We're saying a particular configuration of law in the old covenant in the, is abolished and God has given us a new revelation in Christ, which sometimes have some of the old the concepts same, same and stipulations. However, there is a discontinuation and a continuation in Jesus. Yes. Yes. Neither ten, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, no one lives their life by the. We yes. do not. That's right. Because the Ten Commandments, for example, thou shalt not commit adultery. No Christian follows that one. Man, just man, stay with your one or many wives. Mm -hmm. It does not preclude you from having many wives. Adultery there meant stay with your many or your one wife, man. Who can just have one husband, men as many wives as you can. Thou shalt not kill. Do not kill your fellow Israelite under certain circumstances. Yes. yes. Remember the story to keep it holy. You right. and your maids, slaves must rest. In other words, as you rest and you have some slaves, just allow them to rest one day per week. Yes. But the next, the next day, 
slaves are still slaves. Yes. Therefore, if your life is being held by 10, Exodus 20, you can keep slaves. You are only prohibited from killing certain people, and whether they want to be called murder or whatever. So I'm saying, thou shalt have no. The me is saying, Baal, Marduk, Astarte, and all the thousands of ancient gods are literal beings, but only worship me, Yahweh. So when you take it down, going down, and distill what they meant in their primary context, it was just 10 slave rules given for the slaves. It is not all encompassing. There is no way Ten Commandments must pay your tithe. That you must be forgiven. There's no Ten Commandments but you must be humble. Or be right. jealous. There's no way there. It doesn't cover everything. It doesn't. So it's not all encompassing. Yeah. It's not eternal either because there was no one that God before the world was created. Six days you must rest. Yeah. Or obey your parents, your mother, and your father. In, I mean, in the Lord. Yeah. To whom did God say that in eternity? No. Thank so you. the letter and the formation is timely to Israel. The yeah. principles beyond, behind it, as it were, yeah. love to God, yeah. is yeah. timeless. Yeah. But you do not take the timely expression yeah. as being eternal. Right. You, you take the principles, principles. behind it. Yes. That's right. And this is meant for. So the yes. Ten Commandments is just ten rules given to the slaves as they came out of Israel. It's very limited. Amen. Yes. It doesn't cover so many things. Yes. yes. <laughs> with, with, with the code, you don't commit adultery, but in the spirit, you don't lust. Right. With, with, with the code, you don't murder. With the spirit, yeah. you don't hate your brother. Yeah. Because yes. you would have already committed murder. With the code, you are, are focused on keeping a day. In the spirit, you find rest in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus trumps that. The new law, the new covenant trumps the Ten yeah. Commandments. Thank you, pastors. Yes. Thank you. Christ is truly our conscience, isn't he? And, uh, I think Dr. Christopher stand up. He will definitely speak to us. Dante Kime, please. Dante. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I don't know. It, yeah, it's night. <laughs> I don't know what time it is. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed the, the presentation. Yeah. There's one thing Thank that you. the Lord has been uh, teaching me. And that is uh, when you follow the, the major principle, like about was the major principle of salvation and uh, the sanctuary 1844 issue, such that when I find something in the book of Revelation that is talking about something I don't really get, I'm not going to go and destroy the principle of knowing that Christ did not enter in the most holy place in 1844. That's the major principle. Yes. But yes. When I find something that is talking as if it is trying to say there was something that will happen in future, I have to say the principle says when he died, according to the many witnesses of the scripture, says he entered once in the most holy place when he went to heaven. Yes. That should not be broken. That yes. should not yes. be broken. And that is what helps me to understand that uh, when the Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter uh, nine, where it says until uh, 70 weeks are determined to your people and thy, uh, and thy city to rebuild Jerusalem and to bring an end to sin, to finish the transgression and to bring an end to sin. This prophecy, we usually read it, but the Bible says in the period of Christ, Christ will bring an end to sin and will bring in an everlasting righteousness. That gives me a clear picture to say in the period when Christ, will, the Messiah will come, God will deal with sin once and for all. 
there will, ne there will never come a time when after 1844, now they will start cleansing sin, they will start like those really do not, do not really want water. If we go to the um, Adventist teaching where they say uh, what the high priest was doing in the earthly sanctuary is exactly what Christ is doing. When the high priest enters the most holy place, he was not supposed to leave the most holy place until he finishes the cleansing of the sanctuary. But when Christ died and went to heaven, when Mary says, when he told Mary to say, don't touch me, I've not yet ascended to my father. He went to heaven and he came back again on earth. So how possible is it that the, the high priest can go before finishing the process and then he comes back? That tells you to say it was totally different from what the high priest on earth was doing to the earthly sanctuary. So um, I want just to have one question that I really want to understand. Daniel chapter seven, when it says, in the period of when the, the little horn was saying some pompous words, verse 13 to say, I saw one like the son of man coming to the ancient of days and the cloud followed him. And that's one of the scripture that Adventist uses to say that time is the period when the the little horn was on the scene and they saw one like the son of man going to the ancient of days. <laughs> and that process was the process when Christ enters the most holy place just after 1798, according to right. what we were told. I want to understand that movement or that aspect that happened between when the little horn was speaking pompous words. That's when Daniel saw one like the son of man coming to the ancient of days who was followed by the clouds. I, I really want to understand that. That's, okay. that's uh, okay. my question. Um, we, I, I don't know if we can share this after we shut down and talk because the hour is late. Um, and maybe Dottie, we can share in our window off of Facebook if you would like to hang around for our little discussion there. Would, would that work for you? Okay, I, I do want to I do want to make men mention here. By, by the way, Doctor, uh, whatsoever uh, and whatsoever it means, though, that has nothing to do with an investigative judgment starting in 1844. An investigative judgment starting in 1844 has to do with the investigating or looking into the records of the saints, mm -hmm. as it were. The little horn in Daniel was the evil. Mm -hmm. And the investigative judgment is not about looking into the powers of evil, so to speak. It's examining the saints. The saints, yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it doesn't match up. Yes. It yeah. doesn't match up. Yeah. And, and there's so much more to that, which, as you rightly say, we, yeah. we kind of get into right now. But whatever it is, is that. And, and by the way, another principle, again, which we've got to work with. You cannot... Trump, uh, Daniel, I mean, the New Testament with Daniel. The New Testament from Matthew to Revelation is saying that the entire Old Testament finds or found it, its fulfillment in Jesus. Amen. There can be no doubt about it. the entire Old Testament, irrespective of what it's about. It finds its full. Jesus himself said that you are studying the scriptures, thinking that in them you have life, but they are they which testify of me, yet you refuse to come to me. In other words, the entire Old Testament finds the fulfillment in Jesus. Principle number one. Principle number two. The fulfilled reality in Christ does not bear a one-to-one -one with the Old Testament symbols or prophecies that pointed to Christ. In other words, when the fleshing out of the reality in Christ, the fulfilled reality in Christ, when you look back at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a different configuration. The New Testament flesh it out in a different configuration. So that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So that 
priest was in the Old Testament and he went from one apartment to the other. There were books, da, 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 da. When it comes to the New Testament, the thing transform and change. It's like the caterpillar. Uh, and then it was, there was a caterpillar and afterwards it turned butterfly. When you look at the butterfly, if you did not know caterpillar before, you could never believe that, hey, that butterfly, beautiful flying around, came from a caterpillar. It's something like that. You know, there's a transformation, a reformulation of both the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, and everything in the New Testament. It's a very, very important principle which cannot be missed. And I like what you're saying, Brother Dante, is that in principle, I hear you to be saying, you go by the clear words of the New Testament. The principle. The clear principle. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that was a believer in him to not perish but everlasting life. Right. When you have that clear principle, don't doubt it by some esoteric thing in Revelation where John was using some apocalyptic language. And sometimes, I mean, it's so complex and complicated that sometimes I wonder if John even recognized what he was. I mean, I'm speaking, you know, <laughs> in, 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 in very, you know, exaggerated terms. But the point is, you do not leave the clear teaching of the New Testament and go to some apocalyptic language and complex and try to know, you know, apocalyptic movements have always done that throughout the centuries. Leave the plain teaching of scriptures and go to the obscure teachings and then now judge the plain teachings in light of the obscure teaching. What wrong with us, man? Mm -hmm. Dr. S. What do you? <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Okay, I have, I need to entertain just one thought from Facebook so that they know we are watching them as well. Okay. And um, I want to entertain here a, a good point that Jill Ford makes. She states that um, the cross of Christ has been greatly diminished, whereas the judgment, the last judgment, as it were, has been greatly enlarged. And there's an exchange yes. for the cross being diminished to the judgment being the greater thing. However, she says the cross is the center of history and of judgment. And the last judgment always points back to the cross. Amen. The finished work of Christ at the cross and the means is by faith, not law in justification and that's the point she thanks you for your presentation and she has a sort of a question dr dr baldwin she yes. says um what's, what you know is the law renewed or is it actually done away with mm -hmm. is it a renewed law as opposed to a law done away with the the new testament over and over is very categorical yes the New Testament is, we've got to understand law as the Bible writers understood it. Yeah. Law in Bible is not a standalone entity. Yes. Law throughout scripture is pegged to covenants. Covenants. Yes. Yeah. We are understanding law in our modern sense of the word as particular stipulations. No, law in Bible are expressions of covenants. That's the word law and covenant is used interchangeably throughout the Old Testament. The Bible and the basic, we, we discuss that and many other right. places in my book, etc. So law <laughs> and <laughs> covenants <laughs> are intricately linked. Law is the expression outworking of covenants. The ancients yeah. did not have law as standalone entities. Laws came within context of relationships called covenants. One. So, so let me let me clarify covenants. here for everybody to understand. You're saying that there are laws that come under the umbrella of various covenants. Yes. And there are different covenants within salvation history. For example, there's a covenant with Adam and Eve in the garden. There's a covenant with Noah. There's a covenant with Abraham. There's a covenant with the children of Israel at Sinai. There's right. a covenant uh, coming That's out of brand. Babylon cap <laughs> captivity. And there's a covenant with Christ. You have continuation and discontinuation. For example, take the covenant with Adam in the garden. The laws under that said, Adam eat only vegetables. Eat, go naked, dress the garden, etc., etc., etc. The new covenant with 
Now and now, you have some continuation of discontinuation. Now he is now allowed to eat meat, and there are different things, right? They have the covenant with Abraham, children with Israel, etc. In each configuration of covenants, uh -huh. you are obligated to obey the law as they come under that particular covenant. Covenant, okay. yes. So but a law we Years in a new covenant does not mean that the old covenant, the previous covenant, is applicable or enforceable. It only means that this is a carry over. I got you. Carry over law now gains its constitutional authority from the new from the covenant new basis and peg. It's like saying, ah, oh, my country, Jamaica, in 1961, 62 was under British rule. Under British rule, they pay taxes. They gain independence 1962. In 1962 onwards, we continue to pay taxes. But the taxes being paid at an independent na nation now gains a new constitutional authority. And as such, therefore, the new independent na nation is free to nuance, to change, to abolish, etc., to reconfigure the taxes yeah. on a new system. Wonderful. So, you see what I'm so that's how yeah. law goes within scripture. So the yeah. new covenant has its law, and the hub of that law is the person of Christ. And the yeah. person of Christ you can ever think of. Yeah. You do not need to go back to the old configuration right. because the old configuration is inadequate. Um, Wonderful. So again, to clarify, the law, the covenant, the covering, under which the law is, once yes. the covenant is removed, the law moves with it. E yeah. Exactly, exactly. Good, that's beautiful. But, and you will have carryovers, but you do not say that because thou shalt not kill occurs in Christ. Yes. Then the enforceable authority of thou shalt not kill is old covenant ten commandments. No, it's because thou shalt not kill reappears in Christ, and the reappearance in Christ now have new formulation, new every God thing, and wow. told and a whole. One of these days, you must go to law. And this is amazing because for. this is something that, as a church, we have not studied, Doctor Baldwin. We have yes. not. Not, not, not in this way. No. 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 We have not studied and, and, this. And we people are resistant to it. People yes. are resistant to it. We don't understand they, they don't understand covenants. Yes. Yes. They don't understand Never covenants. Yes. That. Yes. I don't remember one lesson quarterly studying the covenants. Yes. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm glad you answered that so clearly. We will at this time, um, I don't think we will entertain any more questions, but we will have our, our announcements and then our closing remarks and closing prayer. Thank you, uh, Pastor Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful evening. Dottie says we, we have a fear of approaching the Bible with an open mind, which is, is so true. It's so true. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let, just to share a few reminders with you. Uh, on April 3rd, we'll have the, our next presentation, and that's going to be uh, by our guest presenter, Dr. Milton Hook. Yeah. And then two, two weeks from there, we will have Dr. Enrique Ramos, who is usually on here with us. Do you have any details about April 3rd, uh, Dr. Rez? I do. In, in a nutshell, we're going to hear a wonderful testimony of a gentleman who bumped into a rabbi and was able to get great information on the Day of Atonement and how the, the Jewish people actually um, uh, celebrate it. And it's quite different from what we grew up understanding the Day of Atonement to be. And we will know more about the blood of Christ if it were, was defiled or not. We will know also about Azazel. So there's some great things to discover when we have Dr. Milton Hooks. He's also the author of the biography of Desmond Ford. So he's going okay. to be a very interesting. So man. You're, you're, you're going in and out there. So just to clarify, April 3rd, we're going to be looking at the Day of Atonement 
through the eyes of a Jewish rabbi. Yes, yes. Not that, um, not Milton Milton Hook. He's not a Jewish rabbi. He's not the rabbi, but he will be looking at it from that perspective. Exactly. All right, we're looking forward to to that presentation. Yes. Again, if you have any questions or if you want to share anything with us, you can contact us by email at christianscholarsforum at gmail.com. The YouTube for uh, the, I'm sorry, the video for today's presentation will be on YouTube. Dr. Ez usually does the editing and get it out, and she's usually pretty quick with it. Um, sometimes we have it ready by Saturday night or uh, by Sunday morning, but it will be available um, for you to see. Uh, you will also be able to um, view that on Eden Home Ministries studies um, when they become available we here at christian scholars forum we are sponsored by different um, ministries of which some of us are leaders two of those ministries are actual church ministries we have the kayoma ministries under the leadership of dr uh, clinton baldwin and his associate pastor moses marsh they are headquartered in spanish town jamaica you can join their services on Saturday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Jamaica time, which would be 11.30 Eastern time. And the ID to join their worship service is 883-3844-96. And the passcode is simply DMI. You can also visit their website, dikayoma.com, www.dikayoma.com. Dot com. One of the doubles is missing there. And then we also have Eden Home Ministries uh, under the leadership of myself, Pastor Brian Reed and Pastor Arthur Branner, um, who is very, very, very close to doing his, um, his defense of his doctoral uh, dissertation. We, we we're looking forward to that. So we're looking forward to that. And you can join our service on Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. The ID 826 four 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 one six five nine seven and the passcode is simply eden and you can visit us at www.edenhomeministries.org don't forget to check out the resources that we share from time to time if you want to get any resources again you can send us an email and we'll be happy to assist you with getting those resources thank you so much for joining us again and god bless you i now turn over to uh, back to dr rez Thank you, Pastor Brian. Dr. Clinton, last word, sir. We appreciate a, you and thank you so much for your presentation once again. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so very much, everyone, for sharing with us on Christian Scholars Forum. We continue to search and to learn and to grow and to develop. We do not claim to know everything on this forum. We are learners. We are here because we are in the quest of learning and growing and developing. And we invite you to come with us on the journey. It's an exciting journey. We believe that as we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Amen. So our mantra is find the truth and expand your mind. Our mission is to, to advance truth, expand minds, and encourage hearts through research, education, and the creation of new knowledge. And our vision is to be the premier forum for the presentation of biblical truth. The premier forum for the presentation of biblical truth. And we're very serious about that. We have just started. We have just started just a few months ago. We are just warming up the level and the depth of scholarship which we intend to bring to the fore will be astounding as we move forward. We're committed to that because Jesus was a scholar and knowing and learning is freedom and release, mm. joy mm -hmm. and happiness. Ignorance is not good. So Christian Scholars Forum will continue to unravel new truths and expand the mind please stay with us there's much much more to come yes sir. In the bible and many others there is so much more to come i'm excited about it we are just crawling right now trust me 
we will be sprinting in cutting edge material information by God's grace. Thank you so very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening of the weekend and please stay connected. Stay tuned. God bless you real good. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin. And again, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Dynamic. Uh, right now, we're going to go to England. I know our British friends there are super tired. It's probably almost 12 o'clock there, and they have hung in there. We so appreciate you. And for all of you who've joined us in different parts of the world and have stayed awake, we appreciate you. John, yes. please close for us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you came and died, that you are actually the summation of scripture yes. and the summation of all things, mm. that we are able to stand before you in the perfection of your glory and your wonderment oh, with which you cover us. Yes. Lord, may we remain as a community connected wholly to you. May the Holy Spirit be in the midst of us testifying to you mm. that we may indeed know that we are a saved community inside you and in doing that, that we can look forward to the great day of your coming without fear, but knowing full well that you will raise us up and give us life. For you have submitted it and you have guaranteed it at the cross. Yes. Now, Lord, we ask these things that you will bless us all and keep us till next time we come together. In your holy and blessed name. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us on Facebook. Thank you for those who will join us, YouTube on YouTube and thank you for our panel members and all of us in the Zoom window. Good night and farewell. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you by now. Again. We are now going off of Facebook Live and for those of you still listening, you are welcome to come into the Zoom and share. All right, this is now Afterglow. <laughs> yes. We need to uh, um, close down Facebook, Pastor Brian. Everything is closed down. Okay, maybe my signal is taking a time. Thank you. Yeah, my son is saying Facebook is still going on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, it's gone now. It's yes, gone. mind it, you. It was my end that was slow disconnecting it. Oh. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I had oh, internet yeah. problems that we got Thank through. You. Yes. Yeah. Good. That Thank was you. so fabulous. Let's go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Really good. Thank you for your prayers. The computer held up. Oh, yes. I see why they call you doctor, man. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm just messing with doctor. <laughs> I, I don't know to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, when you don't know to answer, you stay quiet. <laughs> and, and smile. <laughs> and smile. Smile and nod. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, Carol. It was just profound, profound. Mm. Let, let me make sure everybody can open. Okay, you can all open your mics now. Dr. Baldwin, I thank, thank you again. Awesome presentation. Oh, thank, you. Yes. thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Hi, Carol. That's Carol. Uh, That's I have Carol. a question. From um, Australia, right? Yeah, from Australia. What time it is there now? Um, it's uh, 20 to 11. Uh, 20 to 12, 20 before midday. Wow. 20 minutes before midday. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, before midday, okay. Before midday. On Sunday. <laughs> On Sunday. 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 Yeah. Sunday. Wow, wow. <laughs> um, I, I asked that question about how, how do we know what sin is. Um, if, but, but I understand what you're saying is that were you saying that we know it because we study the teachings of Jesus? Is that what you were saying? Yes, yes. Jesus himself said, you know, the, the Holy Spirit will come with the world of sin, of sin because they do not believe in me. Amen. Uh, um, you know, they, they, I know. They, 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 I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I just ahead, know please. that 
personal experience that if you are saying, you know, the spirit will teach you, that can become very subjective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the spirit can say some very interesting things to a lot of people. That is true. If we are still reeling from what happened with Ravi Zacharias in America. Say it again. Oh. You, you, you would all, we are still yeah. reeling. Okay. That great scam with Ravi Zacharias. And very very disappointing, still, huh? Yes. Oh, it's beyond disappointing. Oh, but he, the spirit evidently convinced him but he could have all these women all around the world as a reward for the work that he was doing for God. Wow. You know? Who, who I mean, was it that says there are many spirits? Doc? Where's that text? <laughs> Got to try the spirits. Yeah. Yeah. And, and John See whether they are of God. That's right. Amen. Well, how does yeah. the spirits? How right. does one try the spirits? What is the benchmark for because trying the, the spirits? The, 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 the benchmark. The, 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 the benchmark, you know, is what the New Testament believers were doing. Yes. The New Testament believers were using the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ as the right. benchmark. Yes. So in the New Testament, you do have concrete ethics. Yes. Uh, it, 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 it's not just left up in the air. Right. You know, children be obedient to your parents. Uh, Ephesians 6, 1 Corinthians 13. Right. You know, and, and there are many passages throughout Macedon. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Throughout go ahead. the New Testament no. that gives you concrete ethics and guide from which to live. However, the New Testament, the ethics of the New Testament is not based on the Old Testament, Old Covenant. So the life and teachings of Christ is based on the life and teachings of Christ which the New Testament writers now were applying to their situations. So they were using a, 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 a spirit ethic, so to speak, but it has concrete realities. I, I, I think as we consider, the, again, the whole concept of covenants and law, I think it becomes easier. Uh, as, as I said before, laws are not standalone entities. They are pegged to covenant. Covenant has as their platform, as their benchmark, a mighty act of God. And the laws flow out of that mighty act and the definition of the mighty act. So first of all, creation. And so based on what God did by bringing order out of chaos, then he commanded Adam and Eve to do certain things. Again, the flood, God saved a mighty act. God saved Noah. Based on that, laws. Another mighty act. Abraham being called out of, of the challenge, based on that laws are, are given. Another mighty act, the deliverance from Egypt. I am the Lord, that God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then there's the implied, therefore, the Ten Commandments and all the laws followed. The might of God. The final and greatest mighty act of God now is revelation in Jesus Christ. So you have in the New Testament now what scholars call the indicative imperative. That is what God has done for us in Christ. Therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of the living God. You know, the mercy of the living God is Romans chapter 1 through 11, and then chapter 12. Because God has justified you, therefore do this. Because chapter 3, because you've been risen with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I live. In other words, the mighty act of God is now the Christ event, the person of Christ. And stemming out of Christ now are concrete realities of how to live and of course and because christ is alive and well his teachings and his guides and his direction goes even beyond the book yeah. because the yeah. new testament was not designed to tell you how to live in every god situation yeah. right. you know you're having a heart attack or if the doctor's going to operate on you there is no way the new testament is going to guide you how to operate on you yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you have some problems in your backyard right now, you may not be able to run the New Testament to get to how, how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And right. if your kitchen sink is giving some problems, <laughs> etc., you have so much in life. Yeah. A book cannot define how you right. live or guide you in every situation. It's impossible. So yeah. therefore, that's where the spirit of Jesus comes in. However, yeah. the, 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 the Paul says in Galatians, 
that uh, the fruit, fruit of the Spirit, of the spirit. Da, 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 da. against such there, there is, is no law. law. Galatians In other words, 5, when you're going by the Spirit of Jesus, mm. you, although not taught by a written code, you still will be in line with God's will and God's law. Amen. Yes. Amen. The conscience. It's the conscience. And, and, and also, if you study the book of Peter, especially First Peter, he talks a lot about uh, walking in the spirit and how you uh, how you do that in a practical way how in the spirit is everyday behavior exactly in, in, in obedience in truth in loving one another in caring mm -hmm. for one another that 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 re read the book of first peter it gives you yeah. details of how the spirit operates in your life yeah and it, and it was very first oh, peter Yes. It, it, you know, it's also um, can I just say one more thing and then I'll be quiet? Okay. I, I hesitate. I hesitate to say this because you you might think I'm being sacrilegious or, and I certainly don't think that you know, I am in any way perfect. But did I hear you say that? God found fault with the first covenant because the people were still sinning. Is that what Dr. Clinton said? Is he gone? Yeah, no, he's yeah, still there. I'm still there. No. Uh, did, you, did you say that? Yeah. Okay. No, what you heard me to say is that the author of Hebrews said that the first covenant, the evidence that the first covenant was faulty was because the people were sinning. Well, well, yes. well. Yeah. I don't think the I don't think Jesus. Uh, because have you seen the state of the Christian church lately? No, 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 no. Oh, 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 oh. That is because no, but the author be saying that Jesus has mediated a new covenant and perfection has been realized. God's perfection has been realized in him. Not, not in human behavior. Not in human behavior. I say amen to that, but God's people, that is a different story. No, no, no. The author is saying <laughs> that, the author is saying, by the way, it may not be logical to us, but read Hebrews again, and over and over, he makes the point that the evidence that the first covenant was faulty was that the people was sinning. He found and fault with the them. Evidence yeah. God found fault with them. And this is old and obsolete. It makes nothing perfect. It's done away with. The evidence that the new covenant is perfect is not that we are sinning or not sinning. The evidence is perfect is that one man. One man. Has not sinned. Perfected forever. One man <laughs> made the difference. If that's what you meant, mm. I can see that. Yeah, but, 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 um, but, but it carries over to you. It carries it, over. It, it carries over because when as that one man has not sinned, it carried over in the sense, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 10 and 14. All the people who are connected to that one man, while they are growing in grace, while they are still sinning, so to speak, right. they are regarded as perfect. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Not, not because of the... what they do, but because of what he has already done. Yes, perfected yeah, for all times, I... those who are being, being sanctified. sanctified. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So the whole paradigm is shifted, you know. So therefore, we cannot look around to the behavior of the church, of people of the world for hope. Our only hope is that one man. Mercy, mercy. Has already I, I, I'm thinking in terms of um, our witness to the world. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is very little, I'm speaking for Australians, who are notorious 